Forum Borealis Paradigm Expansion Greetings from the North, citizens of Earth, welcome. Today we'll examine the ancient Mayan culture, the science, spirituality and anomalies. Admittedly, this is an area I have very poor knowledge about, so to help illuminate it, we have a guest who's passionate about this subject, so much so that he's made films and books about it. His approach is to use factual elements and weave them into a fictional story. In our discussion, he will elaborate on everything, distinguishing between actual facts, speculation, and how he uses it in stories. Obviously, we'll also be dealing with the Mayan calendar that got so much attention back in 2012. And already in part one, you are in for a shocker concerning this. But first, let's get to know our guest. Stacy James Fry is a long-time listener of Forum Borealis, who is also a filmmaker and author. Born in Calgary, Canada, he enrolled at the University of Calgary for a bachelor program in anthropology between 91 and 94 in the branch of Mayan studies. Disillusioned with academia, he moved to Nelson, British Columbia, which was a hub for free thinkers, bohemians, and alternative lifestylers. There he met artist and spiritual leader Jose Argelis, whom he studied under. Going independent gave him access to all the archaeological digs because he was no longer affiliated with a special university or curriculum. In 95, he started writing his first historical novel on the Mayan, which eventually would become a series. The story details an account of the collapse of the classic Mayan city-states of Tikal, Calakmul, Palenque and Copan, which took place in the 9th century Mesoamerica, a cultural land region located in southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize and Honduras. In 95, he also joined the Vipassana Foundation of Satya Narayan Gwenk and has practiced Vipassana meditation ever since. In 94, he was a leading part of the launch of Kutenay Co-op Radio, the first successful programming committee where he was co-founder and chairman. In 97, a full-time broadcast license was acquired at which point he refocused his involvement as producer, host and creator of multiple successful on-air programs at KCR until he moved to Vancouver in 2000. There he launched in 2001 the publicity division of Granville Island Publishing, a boutique self-publishing service provider. Upon his arrival, he established the publicity, earned media and digital marketing services department, working as their publicity and marketing director until 06. In 07, he became marketing director of Stash Media, when it was just a DVD magazine. However, they saw the writing on the wall for this luxury item, so Stacy Fry convinced the company to apply the streaming technology that he was already familiar with, making them the first global content streaming platform. He effectively saved them by initiating this world first subscription-based streaming platform, so that they eventually would become essential for the VFX and animation industry. Incidentally, an executive of Netflix asked them in detail about this technology, which gave birth to Netflix as we know them today. Since they went off to copy this business model, changed it from dropship DVD to streaming platform, and this technical director is credited with creating quote-unquote Netflix updated business model in 08. Meanwhile, Fry became associate publisher of Stash Media and produced and directed all the viral video adverts, managed their subscriber base and expanded market presence 
and streamlined online buying process. In 08, he left Vancouver and embarked upon his new lifestyle, traveling the world. He first taught Mayan anthropology in Ukraine at the Kiev Moila Academy and created a curriculum for PhD anthropology students specialized in Mayan cosmology. In 10, he created iTravel, an online social network for owners and users of ebook technology, offering access to all ebook catalogs from ebook producers. In 11, he incorporated Mayan Media, where he serves as president and chief executive officer and legally assigned his novel series, The Mystics of the Maya. This company focuses on the development, acquisition and packaging of scripted and factual TV and streaming series, documentaries, feature films and TV studio production infrastructure, graphic novels, internet streaming technology, digital gaming, thematic social media projects and other entertainment media related markets. The current slate includes science fiction, fantasy and period drama, TV and feature films. Maya Media is also a white-label supplier of mobile PC hardware devices for corporate brand label and product incentive uses. In 12, he produced Tree Planter reality TV series. In 13, he won the Bell Media National Fellowship Award, a program that identifies outstanding professionals in the TV industry. Between 13 and 15, he produced the docu-series Legions of a Lost Civilization. In 18, he became chief executive officer of BC Studios, which developed feature film and TV production studio facilities with rural development focus. And in 20, he became a minority owner and board member of Oceanic, which is an equity fund for TV and feature film studio production and urban infrastructure construction around the world. Currently, he is developing a series on Nikola Tesla called Tesla, Man of Light, together with the producer of The Godfather films and 16 other Coppola films. Stasi speaks both English and Spanish and currently is residing in San Cristobal de las Casas in Mexico. Welcome to Forum Borealis, Stasi. Thank you, Al. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so it's Stacy, not Stacy. Uh, actually, here they call me Santi, but yeah, you can call me Stacy. <laughs> Almost Santa. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's short for Santiago. <laughs> and here is Mexico. Although you are Canadian, you're in Mexico right now. Yes, that's right. I'm in uh, southern Chiapas in uh, San Cristobal de las Casas, which is um, sort of in original Tzutzil, Mayan territory. Yeah. Chiapas is part of the uh, Tzutzil, which is uh, one of the um, Mayan dialects, Tzutzil. They're neighbored with the Quiche. Um, so it's Mayan highlands. It's very old territory. It's, okay. you know, there's a lot of speculation. It goes back 10,000 years, but confidently 5,000 years. So the town I'm in is a 5,000-year-old town, okay. which is nice. Right. It doesn't look fine, doesn't it? Okay, very appropriate for the for the conversation today, yes. Yeah. People have heard we are finally going to deep dive into the Mayan mysteries and uh, going to be a part of our, our ancient series. Now, you have an interesting approach to this because you are somewhat of a generalist in this field something you've i understand you've been studying for decades and mm-hmm. <laughs> you've written folks he's written i think it was four books four books not not released them not even tried to release them but he's written them <laughs> finished and that's an interesting way to do this stuff first writing the books <laughs> and then <laughs> releasing it i like it but w- w- what's the philosophy behind that oh uh, there's no philosophy behind it i you know when i started writing this when i started studying it really it was just kind of an inspiration to start writing as probably most writers would would uh, attest yeah uh, and then over the time you learn more things and you realize that uh, the previous versions are outdated and you have new inspirations and you want to include them and so you go through a second draft 
and now a third draft and then a final draft and I'm sort of in between the third and the final mm. and um, and there's just so much to know about this subject uh, to make it interesting and credible really yeah uh, I made a big push to get things ready for 2012 when that was about to happen um, but at the time I was more involved in film and television world and wanted to get documentary series out, uh, but they just weren't interested in anything except the kind of, uh, wild eschatological sensationalism. So I just never got my documentary series off the ground, which was called the divine archive because mm. there was so much out there about 2012 and there's very little to peg, uh, the end date to 2012. And that I sort of had a lot of misgivings about that and actually those misgivings proved to be um uh valid uh, and i just discovered that recently so i discussed with you earlier that i had encountered somebody who you may end up interviewing shortly uh who has clarified a lot of the problems i've had with the mayan calendar issue in terms of how the dates were it's it's um, it's such a scandal. It's so I don't know the right words because it's so simple and it's so basic. And I have to defend myself here because I've never been and I told you this I, I've never been very into the Native American stuff, mm -hmm. uh, just like the uh, Far Eastern stuff and the Native American stuff. I'm like mm -hmm. like anyone else there. Right? blank almost <laughs> my speciality is more the greco-egyptian stuff and things spills over of course because there's no hard lines in this world when it comes to these things but if i had been into that stuff i would have immediately busted the problem and the problem people one of the problems is that the morons who have translated the mayan calendar to our modern that's how you really feel, Al. <laughs> Gregorian calendar. Yeah. They have not even accounted for the, what you call it in English, long year? No, the days out of time. It's days out of time that, that um, they just literally did not account for. And you can kind of see why. Hang on. Uh, I was looking up a word, sorry. Mm. Uh, they haven't even accounted for the leap year. I mean, that's such a basic thing. And, uh, and now you have digged up a guy. Um, what was his name? You can give him a shout out. Lauren W. Jeffries. And I'm really happy to, uh, to come across him because it has been bothering me. And I, you know, I'm not a, a person who dives that deeply into the mathematics of the calendar, but it never felt right to me. Um, I'm more interested in the concepts of the ages, the world ages, and you know that's yeah. pretty much where everybody else sort of sits uh, in terms of the cosmology, because it's really the cosmology and the belief system that drove their civilization, just as it does ours. And the parallels between where the Maya were in the ninth century at the peak and very near the end of their sort of peak echelon mm. uh, is very close to where we are. And I always saw that, and I wanted that to be sort of the focus of what I was writing. But the, the, the calendar, as it was sort of introduced to me conceptually, is so compelling because it does discuss the idea of real time versus, say, mechanized time, right, which we're on. Yeah. And, and to resolve the, that issue and to kind of uh, get into how the Maya perceived it, you have to have accurate mathematics. Hmm. You have to. Otherwise, you don't know where you sit. <laughs> in the calendar right. or when the world is going. And, and the bottom line folks we can go more into this but the bottom line is that 2012 is not the end of uh, what did they call it a long count uh, yeah so, it's, it's actually the end of a world age so it's a long count they didn't really have a Maya name for it that they know of right. um, there may be some speculation on that at this point right and, and John Major Jenkins I remember I listened to him and, and a few others of these guys prior to 2012 and neither of them were talking about the end of the world uh, of course this was they tried to put force it into you know 
the saying about forcing a circle into a square or something that was what's going on because mm. this end of the world concept is really a pollution from the Abrahamic traditions meaning Islam uh, Christianity and Judaism plus uh, the Iranian attachment that came a couple of hundred years ago Baha'i mm. those four religions have the end of the world notions nobody else in the world have ever had it it's completely unnatural mm. everybody else are talking about cycles including the Mayans and so the idea well, the Mayans, Mayans had it the scenario yeah sorry the idea was that the cycle was ending and that 2012 was when the right. formal change was happening but even that's wrong <laughs> it's not 2012 when is the new date according to the real conversion? It's 2087, 2087. So essentially what happened is there's an accumulation of these days out of time that were not accounted for because they were not observed. That was the reason that they were not accounted for. And mm. because they didn't actually write them or inscribe them into their numerical um, accounting right. uh, when they inscribed them on stone or in pottery or anything like that. So the academics just kind of forgot about it, I guess you could say. Mm. Um, but the Maya do account for it. Now, I think that, that Lauren is probably the better person to discuss all this because he yeah. has just spent an entire lifetime. But just in general, every 52 years of a 365-day calendar um, round, there are 13 days of those quarter days that add up. And that's when they perform their new fire ceremony, and that's essentially just a 13-day period, very similar to, say, um, Jewish Sabbath, where they don't do anything. They don't eat do, anything. Do, do, they, do they still keep this, these traditions? Yes and no. Um, as you can imagine, after you know, 500 years of atrocity and uh, sure. <laughs> genocide and everything else, it's very difficult to maintain yeah. the counter days. So there are some tribes that do perform these ceremonies. They don't perform at the same time, so it's essentially their counter days. You know, that was where I was going, because mm -hmm. my question would naturally be when... <laughs> <laughs> when on earth are they doing this stuff because if they haven't have they converted this stuff themselves i mean you know they don't talk to people right they don't right. discuss it um there's only six million left i read yeah there's six million of them there's only that's quite a few but uh but still they, they don't really discuss it and they maintain their traditions and very you know closed doors because you know it's demonized and it is to this day. I mean, in the town that I'm in, there's still an enormous amount of prejudice against the Maya people, even though I'd say the population split here is about 50-50. And the villages all around are all Mayan, and everybody's living off of Mayan agriculture here mm. and um, sort of reaping the benefits of their you know, they're being here, but there's still just an enormous amount of prejudice against them here. So they're not going to open their doors and expose Yeah, because, their... I mean, it's Catholic country, and Catholics are, are extremely prejudiced, so that makes sense. Uh -huh. But I would think that... You know, they don't, they don't call me and say, hey, we're having a ceremony, come on over. You know, that'd be great. You're on their good side. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, over time that may happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I am here for the new fire ceremony. So there is a 52-year cycle that is coming to a conclusion, and it will start um, December 21st uh, this year. Mm -hmm. And it is a it is an end of it is a 52-year cycle. So it is one thing that is happening here that I wouldn't be able to experience in most other places. So I'm I'm actually here for that. But uh, th th that's a great timing on your part because something very special happens on uh, December 21st, no matter what tradition you adhere to, because it's a, it's a basic uh, astrological phenomenon. Okay. And uh, okay. it's that, and, and it's just weird that it ends up on uh, December 21st this year because that's not a rule that it has to do that. But. It's uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto are uh, conjunct in Capricorn, mm -hmm. uh, all three of them. Uh, last time, I, I think, was 3,000 years ago. And um, it's a triple conjunction that is said to have triggered the birth of the great empire of Babylon and the Sumerian people. Mm. And they went on to rule and dominate the world for millennia after. 
So people are expecting that it's going to symbolize a new change worldwide. And uh, let's see, what else is there to add? <laughs> well, this whole business of uh, what is really behind all this COVID stuff and the um, yeah. vaccines thing. And, uh, yeah, it's an interesting timing for that too. Yeah, and, and to see them making this grand push uh, between you, me, and the listener, yeah. it does seem to sort of coincide with a lot of uh, what's going on. Now, I've been talking to Lauren about this, going, okay, so is this 75 years, days out of time? Uh, accumulated and then lived out at the very end all in one chunk or is it sort of beefed out you know over time which is probably mostly the case although there are the Mayan tend to have syncopated rhythms so uh, you know they have 22 known calendar um, systems but I've already experienced uh, or been led to believe that there's so many more I mean they even have calendar systems for microbials right. so in one of the villages I lived, lived in it's called the village of Mani which is a uh, uh, Shea, Tutel Shea uh, tribe, which is part of the Itza. This is where one of the characters we're going to talk about, who is the center point or centerpiece of my novel series, Diego de Landa, um, spent some time and he ended up actually um, doing some horrible things there, which we'll get into later. Um, but they practice open fecalism and have, for, you know, at least as far as the uh, anthropological record goes back. Uh, about two and two and a half thousand years in this village, and that just means that you go into the backyard, you defecate, and and then you <laughs> place under place it under a rock, and then uh, to my amazement, the next day there isn't a there isn't even a, a hint of what you've done remaining. Wow! And it's because the microbial um, component of the uh, agricultural system they have such a, a vibrant earth and soil that they've been cultivating for so long mm. in these places that the microbial um, component uh, takes care of that business and they have a calendar for it as to when these uh, microbials are at their peak activity throughout the day wow that's one example yeah so i started to sort of uh, get into this stuff more and more over time, it really takes a long time. Yeah, but, uh, but stop the train. We're going to get sure. every stop station on the way. We just have to go there gradually. Sure. I'm still at the uh, 21st of December. You're in for a treat because it's probably going to be a clear sky. And uh, on this solstice, uh, you're going to see that it will appear, a very super bright point of light will appear. Uh, it will be two heavenly bodies who almost appear to collide. And that's, yeah, from our perspective. But you're going to see the crescent moon pass Jupiter and Saturn. Hmm. And all this stuff is conflating in uh, 21st of December. But today, we're going to discuss uh, some of the modern mysteries. And I'm like you hinted to, I'm going to have on others for this too. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I have you on is twofold. One, like I said, you have studied this mm -hmm. for decades, and uh, you gave me a name-dropping list, and I, <laughs> I was uh, fascinated because I recognize some names. Just the fact that I don't recognize most of the names is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I'm very well read in these areas, but like I said, not so much Native American. But some of the names I know and I have great respect for them. Mm -hmm. So this tells me your information is quality. And also, like you've already said, you are uh, going to try to make your writings into different kinds of production. So we're going to get back to that too at the end. I, I suggest we first start talking in general about the Mayan mystery and then when we've done that we go into your stuff and, and mm -hmm. let people know the projects you're involved in and all the stuff you want to, to do too sure. in this area. Yeah, whatever is fascinating. I mean, you know, I listen to your show all the time so I have great yeah. respect for for your shows, so I'm happy to go in whatever direction you like. Yeah, cool. And I think this is a perfect topic for this show. Uh, it will, uh, to a large extent, uh, depend a lot on your knowledge, since mine is pretty uh, weak. But I'll be able to ask the idiot questions on <laughs> behalf of me and the listeners. <laughs> We're in the same boat. <laughs> Although I'm sure we have listeners who are 
pretty into this stuff too. So let's yeah. let's begin with the beginning, your beginning. Why are you interested in this stuff? How did you become involved? In it, it really goes back to the calendar. So, I mean, my personal history is that I have First Nations heritage. And so I've always had kind of a um, general interest in this topic. I never lived on a, on a reservation, um, but it always occurred to me that there was a, you know, there was a world here on in, in this continent before, you know, the narrative of the 1492 and, and all of that began. And, and what was it, you know? And you told me that you have uh, Native American blood, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's called Métis in Canada. So Métis? Yeah, it just means that you're mixed blood, right? So right, right. In this case, uh, it's Cree, and um, and then on the European <laughs> side, it's a whole hodgepodge. But from <laughs> the marriage of Joseph Brazo uh, to his Cree wife after he brought his Scottish wife, and she died within a year. <laughs> well, so you can track your lineage. I had to. I had to wow. in order to substantiate my um, my membership in the Métis Nation of Alberta. Yeah, of course, because you look, I mean, you're blonde and blue-eyed. You look like you could live here. So. Exactly. <laughs> but that's so typical. When I see Americans who claim to be natives, all of them look like they, they could come from Ireland or something. I mean, the, the proverbial case, right, Elizabeth Warren, <laughs> Pocahontas. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as you can imagine, uh, just from the way natives were treated uh, in Canada and the United States over the last many years, this was actually kind of a secret of the family. And it's really been my own interest to kind of formalize the, uh, yeah. the, the history uh, in participation with my father, who lost his father early, and I never met him, but he was um, mm. he, he was very embracing of his native tradition. Did you do a gene test? Yeah, I did a gene, a gene test. Yeah, I did do that. Yeah. And um, so I know what percentage I am in general from their their mm. results, 15%. Mm. So it's not a huge amount. Well, f 15. Okay. Okay. That's not bad. <laughs> yeah, I but it's still high. worth mentioning, I mean. I score high on the Indian scale. But anyway. <laughs> right. No, no. For them, you are like... I'm just teasing. Yeah. I'm just teasing. <laughs> Unpure. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah so I had to um, I had to find out and, and it's not easy to find out so we did have to get uh, in order to substantiate this kind of thing you have to go through a process so I had to get what's called a long form birth certificate with my parents right. listed on the certificate then I had to get my father's long form and my grandfather's dead and it just so happened that a member of the family can apply for a birth certificate of a deceased family member after 50 years. And that had just passed. Mm. That demarcation point had just passed when we started taking an interest in this. So it was kind of a, a luck. Otherwise, I would have had to continue to wait for however many years. Uh, so we were able to get my grandfather's um, long-form birth certificate with his parentage. And then we had to connect them to what are called script documents. And script documents are essentially in 1870 and 1900 in Canada uh, in the what is now called Treaty 7 territory, which is uh, mostly of Alberta, if anybody knows Canadian geography. It's the province of Alberta. Mm. Script documents are when the government came forward and, and offered money in exchange for land that had already been stolen or taken or whatever. And so anybody who was a First Nations um, you know, uh, lineage uh, came forward for their hundred dollars or whatever it was, and mm. their names were put on a list. And this was kind of a, an easy way for the government to get kind of a clear, clear picture of who was out there, get them on a list. And right. this was all in preparation, essentially, for the whole uh, um, school system that they were going to employ, which uh, ripped you know children away from their families and put them in in residential schools essentially yeah. and uh, beat the hell out of them literally mm. that was sort of the theology behind it mm. um and so you know after they came forward for their hundred dollars and they were put on a list uh all hell broke loose and um all misery broke loose <clears throat> but i had to connect um the parentage of my grandfather to names on that script document mm. So I did that through the Glimbo Museum in Calgary, and then to my amazement, this whole world of my lineage opened up, and I found many, many names, including some famous people that I didn't know I was uh, related to, locally famous, not world famous or anything. Yeah, but, but, but don't let it go to your head, because most people <laughs> are actually related to, yeah. even to world famous people, like here in Norway. 
Uh, one of the most famous kings in the Viking time is called um, Harald the Hairfair, mm-hmm. and half the population can genetically be tracked back to him. Yeah. Then you have, uh, I don't know, did you listen to the show we did with uh, Scott Walter about the Templars and uh, Vikings yeah. in America? The two of the three episodes. Um, you, you, you heard two. So yeah. uh, I don't know if you heard where he talked about, no, I think that's in part three, three Jesus lineage. You know, I'm sure half the world can be tracked back to to Jesus too. Well, we're all trying. Because he has he has a lineage, and the same with I think one of the most heritage rich person is uh, was one of the Mongols, I think maybe Genghis Khan or something. Mm -hmm. He banged a lot of women, so uh, that's very common because we're many now, but we used to be few. So it's just logical, right? Yeah, it doesn't go to my head. I just, uh, I found it interesting to have that world open up to me. And these were areas that I'd been familiar with my whole life. You know, the Brazo Dam, the Brazo River, the Brazo Region, the Brazo Mountain, all that stuff. Right, and I, right. I'd always known those names and kind of looked at them and thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what this guy was all about. Turns out that's my cool. my uh, great-great-grandfather or whatever. Hmm. By the way, if you listen to part two, did you hear my theory about Columbus? Yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah. And you know what? It's very interesting that you should point that out because that's something that you should poke and learn about. Mm. He, well, I can't remember the specifics of your theory, but basically, could you repeat it for me just so I can remember exactly? Yeah, yeah. But it's it has to be understood in context of what we know about the Templars, the Vikings, and yeah. the natives. Yeah, yeah. If we don't have that knowledge it doesn't make sense but basically he expected to find a template state he expected to find survivors right. he didn't know what he would come to it could be like populated as they knew it was so it could uh-huh. be soldiers right thousands of soldiers so he had to come by Templar flag instead of Spanish you considered the possibility that the Portuguese were using the Americas from about 1300 50 on as a source of tin, as a lot of the tin mines uh, have been running dry in the uh, the isle. Of the I, I don't see. I don't see what, how the Portuguese could, because they couldn't just. We know uh, that happened. We know that uh, the Norse. Well, I don't know for tin, but we know that. Uh, actually, we know that the Templars went there from the first time. I think was in 500. Yeah. After Christ. It was way back. Yeah. But, but so when you say the Portuguese, uh, if you mean the Portuguese nation, it doesn't sound realistic at all because then everybody would know. But yeah, there may be, yeah. s- there that's, may be the just Templars. Write and, uh, just write that down and bring it up with Lauren. Okay, okay. Because he has very, very well developed um, ideas about that that are not his own work. They're based on some very well studied work. Cool. Yeah, I think he, I think you will find it cool. I think you'll find everything about Lauren cool. <laughs> mm. I mean, he is old, but he's very eloquent. And you know, if he if you just give him a chance, he starts blowing your mind immediately. Yeah. And to your point of uh, everybody being related to somebody famous, I, the way I look at that. This is a topic of yours, your Atlantis, and your various other series. Your pre-Diluvian, your all those things. I mean, there were some narrow, narrow points in history where most of humanity was wiped out, and very few people right. actually made it. Through. And, and we're we're all related to those very few people. I mean, it mm. you know it goes down to some speculation where there may be we're related to all of a hundred people. The last time one of these things occurred, uh, potentially as recently as twelve thousand five hundred years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about that too. But back sure. to the Mayans. So how how did you erase an interest in this? Yeah, so it really was Jose Arguelles. Um I was living in this town, small town in, in Canada, in the mountains, very alternative-minded town. In mm. fact, it's where the vast majority of um, the draft dodgers went uh, during the Vietnam War. <laughs> So when they headed north into Canada, they headed through Idaho and uh, and a slim, narrow portion of Washington and Montana, right. and they ended up in what is called the West Kootenays. Mm. And the West Kootenays is named after the Kootenay Indian. Anyway, my sister was living there. I'd been sort of bouncing around Canada, chasing this girl and going crazy. And uh, when that relationship ended and I was in Vancouver, so they said, why don't you come for, for a visit? So I went out, fell in love with the town, moved out there. 
And it was really kind of an esoteric university nice. in this town. Yeah, it is nice. I mean, when I look back on it, I'd say that was the uh, seminal turning point in my life, moving there, um, because it's essentially just a complete rejection of all things modern, and everybody's more or less experimental mm. and exploratory of all the... Um, you know, the secret traditions, whether it be uh, the Rosicrucians or the Freemasons or... Hey, hey or do, do they have uh, Waldorf schools there? They have Waldorf about? schools, yes, they do. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a hippie town. Say no more. It's basically where the 60s went and, and survived in a time capsule format. So from the... In Alberta of all places. No, no, that's not in Alberta. Oh. So basically I moved into British Columbia, which is um, oh. the westernmost province of Canada. Oh, right. Close, has, close to Seattle, right? Yeah, just north of Seattle. So mm. Vancouver is just north of Seattle. Right. Where I was is just north of um, some small towns in Idaho, mm. central. Okay. Sandpoint and um, Kalispell and... and um, Montana and so on. Anyway, it's just a beautiful place. It's in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. It's gorgeous. It's completely isolated. I mean, you're essentially eight hours away from any major center by by car. Right, right. And so, in the winters, you're just you're in a bit of a yeah, yeah. In, in a bubble, as you know uh, from your experience. Really. Tell me about it. Yes. Yeah. So going there and living there and becoming part of this youth hippie scene. <laughs> Uh, you know, starting to take psychedelics and um, uh, getting into what is a shaman and looking into and having some experiences with some elders and so on and so forth. One of the things that was ripping through town at the time uh, were the books of Jose Arguelles and sort of a, a deep fascination with the Mayan calendar. And this is the first time I'd ever heard of it. So uh, I don't know if you've ever read the Mayan Factor by Jose Arguelles, but it is no. far out, man. Um, and it presents a kind of a template for the rise and fall of civilization according to the syncopated rhythms of this Mayan calendar, which are astronomically based. And that was a very compelling idea because I had already sort of – the way the calendar works, the way he presented it, is almost a carbon copy of – he may have been doing this on purpose, but – he presented it as kind of a psychohistory concept. Mm. Are you familiar with that term? Uh, yeah, but you can go into details. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's part of the foundation series of Isaac Asimov. Isaac Asimov um, presented an idea that a uh, mathematician in some you know, universe far, far away, uh, probably here, <laughs> mm. had, had discovered a kind of mathematics that was a predictive model for um, for future history. Mm. It's called psychohistory. So it's essentially a um, mathematical based, sociological based, predictive model for civilization. And, and that always stuck with me because that was one of my first um, loves was the foundation series by Isaac Asimov. And so, and I don't think I made a direct correlation, but I, I understood the concept really well as far as how Jose was explaining it. And, and it captured me. And then actually what happened was, because this town is so unusual, it ended up that we, as a group, a large group, not a, not a, a coordinated group, but it became pretty clear that there were probably about three, maybe 4,000 people in town that abandoned Gregorian calendar were just living solely on the Maya calendar at that time. Mm. And I was one of them. So, you know, I wasn't the uh, originator of that, but I ended up joining in very quickly. It sort of happened all at once. I, I, I've abandoned it, too. Sorry? I've abandoned the Gregorian calendar, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. how much do you really pay attention to it anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we unfortunately were forced to because of uh, artificial, like, like 31st of December. It has nothing to do with New Year's. Just the word December means the 10th month. Des is 10, right? Nov is 9, Oct is 8, Sept is 7. And that's a remnant from the original calendar, which is so natural and based on nature. Mm -hmm. The Julian calendar, where it says that the 21st of March is spring equinox. And that's when winter is over, sun is returning. Yeah. It's just logical. Spring is here, nature is awakening, the birds are coming back. Because, mm -hmm. you know, north, the birds are migrating. 
mm-hmm. and so when the uh, Catholics forced us to do the Gregorian calendar, they kind of forced us out of rhythm with nature, and we can discuss how far you want to take that, but there are lots of voices who are claiming that's a conspiracy in order to crush the pagan roots, which the pre-Abrahamic traditions were very tied up to nature, just like the Mayan agriculture, yeah. uh, agriculture society. So that you said they have a calendar for everything. Yeah, exactly. It's a science. It's because when you live in a cycle-based society, you have to measure everything so you know where in where it belongs in the typology of things, Mm -hmm. whether space or time. And so when you cut people off their roots and screw with the calendar so everything becomes artificial, they don't longer have something else to cling to, something else to follow, something else to measure by, except for, in this case, in our case, the new religion, Christianity, and their artificial bullshit dates, which also were theft from earlier religions and contemporary religions uh, when it emerged. And so... Yeah, I think it's even subtler than that. I mean, I completely agree with everything you're saying. But one thing that I really... uh, just struck me. I mean, when we're getting into the Mayan calendar at that time, uh, we weren't living on the 360-day calendar or 365 or any of the other components of the Mayan calendar. We were living on the um, Zolkin, which is a 260-day heartbeat, hmm. uh, which didn't really change. It isn't out of sequence. It's not like they account for the leap year in that because they don't need to because over time all the um, all that slide out of time that is created by those sort of uh, fractions. Yeah. The Mayans didn't like fractions, right? So they no. – anyway, I'll let Lauren discuss all that because he's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the idea is that um, you get pretty intimate with your own rhythms. Mm. Right? And getting intimate with yourself is when you get intimate with your internal rhythms, and that's when you come to know yourself and you really start to have a, uh, an awakening so. of, of oneself, right? And that is what is the sinister dissociative or dissonant factor mm-hmm. of mechanized time. I think yeah. that's the sinister aspect of it, the most sinister yeah. aspect of yeah. it. Yes, we are out of rhythm with nature and all of that, but that's an external thing. Mm. When you um, get into natural rhythms, you're getting into your own natural rhythm and you get into your own intuition and your own thought process and your own feeling realizations of things. Yeah, very, very important point. Thank you for making it. And uh, yeah, uh, they they first uh, cut us off the collective rhythm and then they attack the individual. Yeah. Of course, they want an alienated being because they want slaves. They want loyal minions to the new uh, spiritual tyrant. Well, they, want to get, they want to position themselves between you and divinity. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so you you picked it up in this uh, interesting uh, sphere you were yeah. hanging in, and then came all the I guess uh, far. It wasn't very far away. All this 2012 hysteria that was building up. <laughs> well, it was immediate, right? Because um, mm. Eric Greta tagged the uh, end of the long count at 2012, but in '94 that seemed like a long way away, yeah. especially when you're only 22 or whatever. Mm. So. Um, so for me, what, what happened was I loved what he did and I loved what it did for me and I loved the community exploration and everything that that um, did for me. But I started to realize at some point, and I can't really tell you when exactly I heard, I realized, you know, these are his ideas over top of maybe indigenous concepts. And I wanted to get down to the original indigenous concepts because Excellent. it wasn't entirely confident right. that, uh, that he was presenting it properly to see a cult of personality develop and so on and so forth. Hmm. So this precipitated a, a real deep dive into the opposite end of the scale, which is an academic end of the scale. Hmm. Now, we all know how academia is. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, one of the rare instances where academia isn't as calcified around these dogmatic ideologies, and I say isn't as much, because there Mm. certainly is, but Mm. it's more of a fluid academic world because it's kind of a new-ish phenomenon. That always, always helps when it's a new thing, because Mm. it hasn't yet been hijacked by self 
uh, grandiose dogmatists, popes, right? So, yeah, I'd say that's more now than it was, say, back in 97 when I had this realization that mm-hmm. Jose Aguilas might not be the most accurate uh, representation of this uh, indigenous concept. But um, getting into the academic world at that time, it was fairly new in the sense that they hadn't really, you've heard the term crack the Maya code, I'm sure yeah. you've heard that. It's a common uh, thing that was talked about during 2012. I'd say that was one of the better aspects of the 2012 phenomenon. It did uh, shine a light on um, more or less the um, epigraphy, epigraphers, right? So essentially the uh, deciphering of, of Mayan script. Mm. And that really initiated in 72 in what is called the uh, Palenque Roundtable. Now, it's geographically, where I'm at right now is called San Cristobal de las Casas, but about two and a half hours away by car. Well, actually, it's a bit more just because the roads are crazy. But as the crow flies, it's about two and a half hours away, if I could ride a bike or, or whatever straight there, is Palenque. And Palenque is one of the most famous ruins of the classic era. Um, and it's in that town that this Palenque roundtable occurred, and you're going to like this because essentially a couple of hundred years of – Mayan study had occurred, but the roadblock was that they couldn't read the script. And so, you know, all kinds of fantastic things. So, so, so they didn't have, um, ah, what's it called, a stone that they cracked Egypt with? They didn't have a Rosetta stone, no. Rosetta stone, right. No, they didn't have a Rosetta stone. And, and so, you know, all manner of theology had, you know, I mean, this is kind of the nature of, of archaeology is that it's defined by whatever contemporary issues are in play. Yeah. But, but, but two seconds. We've discussed off-air the brilliant Professor Augustus Le Plongeon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I guess he was an Argentinian. No, the reason I have his book is not the Mayan lead, but the mm-hmm. Atlantis lead. He has a book where he proves that... Maya and Egypt have extremely many similarities in symbolism, in language, in spiritual notions. Yeah, the other so much the so, uh, in fact, that there has to be a direct relation. Now, how could he, this chap do all this if... <laughs> I mean, this was after the Rosetta Stone, but how could he have cracked the Mayan aspect of things? If... Well, I mean, there's the language, right? I mean, he lived among the Maya, right. first of all. Right. So he was living around here, and he was learning to speak their language. And in learning to speak various dialects, I mean, there's 32 known dialects of the Maya. Jeez, right? okay. Um, and, and exactly which one he's using, I believe it's the Isa, which is the bulk of the, of the Maya from the Yucatan region. Mm. Um, and, and he was really focused on them. And, well, that's only one of 32, Right. Mm. But was making an etymological etymological uh, association between the uh, that dialect or the two or three dialects that they speak mm. and, and these Egyptian words. So that's great. The problem with that is that, um, you know, from an academic perspective and why he's largely not discussed among academics. Mm-hmm. In fact, he's lampooned yeah. is because he took seriously Mayan shamanism from the perspective of. The mythology uh, that is portrayed in, in uh, you know, on these these ancient ruins, where you have these sort of demigods, right? These shaman kings performing, you know, you could call them miracles uh, or paranormal uh, phenomena. Uh, he took it seriously and almost literally, right? Mm. Um, and so the, he, you know, and that was at a time when the, what was that movement in Europe? Yeah. The, the, uh, was yeah, the, 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 the date for the book is 1896, just so people know what we're talking right. about. Right, so that was during the height of the, uh, what do you call that? The, the, the speech. Victorian? Yeah, but it's kind of like the the whole idea that, well, first of all, the ether science was at its peak back then, so that was influencing yeah. the, you know, su- you know, the perspective of the paranormal and supernatural and all that stuff. Uh, demonology and... You know, Gothic period and uh, yeah. ro- romantic exactly. period. We've been through all that at that point. Yeah, just that kind of spiritism that was you know, oh, yeah. in vogue in, in the Belle Epoque era, and the Gilded Age. Mediumism and also theosophy, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's the one I was looking for. Thank you. Mm. So, so he was kind of part of that, and you know how that's more or less shoved aside by anybody in the academic world. So he didn't get much yeah. airtime, let's say. Mm. Uh, but he has the 
unique distinction of having spent a good portion of his life living among the Maya and spending time around them. And he was the first person much later in my discovery that, that actually took a lot of what I was really interested in, which is the actual science of shamanism, which we mm. can get into in Maya traditions, mm. um, and taking it seriously. And, and that was the first one to do it because it had been demonized, right? Yeah. I don't know how much you want to get into that yet, but let's stick with <laughs> Paul Young. So he was, uh, he was, he was unique that way. Mm. Even today, if you bring him up with any of the academics, they kind of sneer and go, oh, you're not going to take it seriously, are you? Yeah. And, you know, yes, of course I'm going to. Because <laughs> because <laughs> so, so what uh, decent academics could one read on this area? On, on what specific area? Uh, the Mayans and, and the mystics of the Mayans. Is there anyone you would say yeah. contributes? No. Um, yeah, well, there's, there is Peter Tompkins. Uh, Peter Tompkins, he more focuses on Teotihuacan than the Maya, but Teotihuacan, which I don't know if you're anybody who's in your listening doesn't know is just outside of Mexico City and was kind of viewed as the city of the gods by the Aztecs as the uh, is that where that pyramid is that yeah. pyramid of the moon or whatever they call it yeah yeah that's exactly where it is it's a, it's it's a it's potentially a megalithic site right or at least the under layers of it are uh, over top is kind of a more um, traditional classic era construction uh, and there's a lot of epigraphy and iconography in the classic era city states of the Paten, which is essentially uh, southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and parts of El Salvador, where these epic city states from the classic era sort of peaked, uh, to suggest that there was um, uh, trade uh, relationships between um, Teotihuacan and, and, say, cities like Tikal that initiated around uh, 376, I think is 376. Okay, okay, let's do some basic education. Sure. Uh, we need to know two facts before we move into specifics. One, mm -hmm. the Maya, what area are they covering? And two, what time period are we talking about? Okay, so there's, academically speaking, three periods, time periods. There's the pre-classic, the classic, and the post-classic. The pre-classic is academically concerned with about 1500 BC to 150 AD. Mm. And then you have a collapse of um, the uh, sort of nation states that have been built up and sort of thriving up until that point. And that's essentially the Mirador Basin, which geographically... So, so 2,000 two years. Yeah, academically, I'd say it, go back, it goes back much further, but yeah. that's my opinion. Um, and then there's the classic era, which kicks off around, so it's sort of like this dark period of about 100 years after the collapse. And then you've got the sort of um, revitalization of city-state concepts and the popping up of these new city-states around 250 AD. And, uh, and then it peaks, and those city-states uh, are abandoned around the uh, 9th century. That's that's one of the many mysteries surrounding them, right? That they just completely abandon cities overnight well, for no I'm good reason. Not, Eric, there is no mystery anymore, but um, it's not common. To it. It's cracked. Oh yeah, I mean this is all fairly straightforward stuff. But so, so what was the re what was the reason? Well, let's talk about that later when we get into the novel, okay. because that is the entire concept. Of ah, cool. So uh, that's a classical era. Yeah, that's the classic era. Then the post-classic era is sort of a new renaissance of Mayan culture and civilization that takes place in the Yucatan region, uh, sort of picking up, almost overlapping with the classic era. So a couple of those city-states start around 700 AD, but they don't really get going until about 1000 AD. Mm. And that's really when the post-classic era kicks off and, uh, and then ends more or less when the Spanish arrive, although those city-states kind of collapsed and everything was sort of devolved into tribalism before the Spanish came. So, yeah. And then you have the peak of the Aztecs and you know at that same time. So, so the Aztecs are like a degenerated uh, successor of the Mayans? No, I don't think so. That's more of a common uh, ac orthodox academic view right. that right. is a result of Spanish propaganda. Yeah. I, I'm sure it is, but that's that's the crumbles uh, I've had access to. But that's not to. the academic view. <laughs> the academic view is that they were bloodthirsty savages. 
to kill the man. I'm polluted by those dogmatic mainstream claims, right? So, so I'm glad you're correcting mm-hmm. it. So, Aztecs, you would re- regard them as a different, uh, altogether different beast? Uh, yes and no. Um, they certainly carry on the Mesoamerican cosmological tradition, and um, and they were certainly uh, living among city states, which is a similar kind of structure and they certainly performed uh okay so the sort of the combining aspect is the calendar Mm. all these cultures and even as far north as seattle which lauren will get lived that we know lived on what is commonly referred to as mayan calendar i wouldn't even call it mayan calendar anymore so so everybody used the same calendar so then it becomes like the indian system exactly so what i see now in a big picture like pull back right you have you know, whatever took place 12,500 years ago that caused these megalithic sites to be abandoned and that culture to essentially be erased off the face of the earth all over the earth, uh, you have this transcontinental culture, still unified but probably in shambles, um, still using and operating under the same time system, so the same calendar system, mm. which has cosmological roots and, of course, also has uh, refined hyper-refined, ultra-refined yeah. mathematical understanding of astronomy, and not just local astronomy, but deep space astronomy as well, which again, yeah. Lauren will discuss with you. So I'd love to leave it to him. Yeah, and, and here also kicks in one of the people in your long list of bibliographic names. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, there's four people on that list I, I want to interview. One is obviously Graham Hancock, Mm-hmm. And another one is Robert Bouval. A third one yeah. is Adrian Gilbert. Now these are famous names, and I should have yeah. I should have interviewed them long ago. It's it's a crime I haven't. Okay. <laughs> but there is one more name that people probably don't know, and that's Maurice Cotterell, a Brit. Uh, and Maurice Cotterell is well among those guys. Yeah, uh, the reason I know about him is that uh, one of my teachers, uh, who's passed by now, but he was, uh, I don't know if he was a close friend, but he was an associate of Maurice Cotterell, and I've I've listened to Maurice Cotterell, and I read some of his stuff, and, you know, I can't judge his Mayan stuff, Mm -hmm. uh, that I can't, but I can indeed judge some of his other esoteric stuff, plus, uh, as far as my brain allows, I can also judge his science stuff. What do you think about his approach? Well, Maurice is interesting because he was one of the first to really introduce the idea to me that, um, you know, this Mayan calendar might be related to uh, sunspot cycles. Right. And and that blew my mind. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I'm feeling in the dark, right? Mm. I'm just coming out of um, the cult of Jose Arguelles and, mm. <laughs> you know, and so on. And... Um, getting used to the idea of uh, some of these academic uh, concepts. And then he blows in with this hard science correlation that he was, you know, it was a supposition at the time. He wasn't saying it was accurate. Mm. But reading that book opened up the idea to me that this wasn't just some rudimentary astronomical calendar system. This was something that was deeply refined and potentially could account for a lot of these things out there. Mm. So I didn't think after after a long time after reading his book, um, The Mind Prophecies, uh, it took me a while to say to myself, OK, his work is probably not accurate in respect to the Mayan calendar because it wasn't mathematically. It just mm. didn't fit. Mm. But the idea that it could fit if we could spend some time, some of our satellite time and some of our dish time, you know, mapping out these things, then maybe there would be a correlation if some more energy was put in that direction. Um, but nobody did, right? Mm. So, you know, that was kind of a dead end um, in terms of the scientific potentiality of that. But I always thought to myself, well, that would be a really interesting study. Mm, I agree. If you, if you start putting uh, the calendar out um, into some of these nuanced rhythms, because the sun is so important to the Maya, obviously. Um, you know, their concepts of the sun and what the sun was are in an animistic tradition are very similar to this idea that that I came upon when I started really getting into Tesla science was the was the rhythmic the literally the the frequency relationship between our atmosphere 
and our condition on Earth and what the sun is doing in yeah. terms of the solar wind and sunspots and everything else. And that kind of, that really caught me. Yeah, but, but you know, if they are, which I think they are, and probably you too, we will see when we discuss it, but if they are children of the mm -hmm. really ancient, let me rephrase it. If you go back far enough in time, you'll see that all spiritual traditions were based on the sun, at least all the good guys. <laughs> There may have been a black tradition too, but that's another matter. And yeah. the sun worshippers, Uh, the children of the sun, you know, they all are fragmented colonies or survival spots from the pre-Ice Age civilization. Let's call it Atlantis, uh, lack of a better word. And yeah. I don't care how advanced or primitive you imagine it to be. Mm -hmm. The just the concept is that there was such a civilization. And uh, the Greeks who got it, among else, through Egypt, they had... They preserved that calendar too. They call it Platonic Year. Right. In in India, which is another survival spot, it's called a Yuga, or, or that's one of the time measurements. So they all all these ancient systems have were big on calendars. Mm -hmm. You know, Babylon, uh, the Sumerians, big on astronomy and astrology, which is nothing but measuring. You know, when you measure the movements in heaven, you also measure time. Mm -hmm. Time and space cannot be separated. So, we, when we move westwards to the Americas, we see the exact same aspects, traits of the traditions uh, measuring. Yeah you, yeah, you see an overarching loom of uh, yeah of understanding, yeah, which is which which they have in common with with so so I think they are survival spots from the pre ice age civilization which also makes sense why everyone what's the what's the one uh, inca that's the one in the south right they yeah. too had such a calendar didn't they um you know i don't know to be honest about <laughs> their calendar i <laughs> okay. can only surmise that they did because of all the evidence of how far north this calendar reached and because how similar the cosmology is of the incas to the maya It's very similar cosmology. In fact, all the, the native traditions have a similar sort of origin story. And, you know, there's new evidence. I, I don't know if we talked about it, but I did develop a series called Legends of a Lost Civilization mm. for television, for discovery. And essentially it feeds off of a lot of the work of, um, you know, Jose, or not Jose, um, Sorry, yeah, what was his name again? We were just discussing Graham Hancock mm. and Robert Bouval and, and all those guys, right? Adrian Gilbert and, and so on. Uh, and it and really speaks to this idea that captured me in this open. I mean, anytime you take the approach of any indigenous culture, you start getting into it. As long as you have an open mind, you end up coming to the conclusion there are previous global civilizations. Mm. If you dive into the forbidden archaeology, uh, as far as the artifacts that, that get shoved aside because they don't fit the narrative, mm. and you start including them in your thought process, you just can't help but consider, um, you know, there's this previous global civilization, possibly more than one. Mm. Because anatomically speaking, I mean, this is just getting into the history of humanity's biological history. Um, anatomically modern humans, so with the brain capacity that we have, go back about 124, 125,000 years, and this is one of... No, it's, it's, um, it's more now. Now, now the, I mean, the dogmatic approach, sure. it's... How far you want to take it, the point is, what have we been doing? Right. Right? And, and you know, if we're theoretically capable of the same sort of brain capacity, thinking capacity, yeah. tool-making capacity uh, for maybe hundreds of thousands of years or however far you want to take it back. It's a long time. Mm. <laughs> and, and so what have we been doing, right? And then you have the dogmatic side that says, well, if there were these civilizations, then where is the evidence? Well, the evidence is in megalithic structures, for one. Yeah, because that's what survives. Right, and then you consider cataclysm. Uh, you throw cataclysm into that, and I mean yeah. real cataclysm. Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, uh, most everything else is going to get wiped off the face of the earth, right? So yes, and and the same would happen to our civilization today. There's nothing we'd be making now that would survive. But this stuff belongs to uh, Hancock and those guys. Yeah. We don't have to spend time on it. And I, no. I bet no. most of our listeners are already familiar with this, or at least 
Uh, uh, not just for Melee, I think they're in favor of it too. But before we go on, I asked you... Um, I just the, want to say one more thing, though, if you don't mind, because it gets into the genesis yeah. of the novel that I'm writing. It's like, okay, well, if that's true, we've had these previous global civilizations, we're on the precipice of another cataclysmic event. We have to be, because we now have possession of technologies that we can essentially wipe ourselves out with. Mm. Um, and, and so on, right? And then we're at this sort of peak civilization where we've got whatever, however many billions of people now. It's more or less a, a replay of some of these cosmological concepts. And this fits almost perfect time with the Mayan calendar. And that was another thing that sort of grabbed my attention about all this, mm. is that we're headed for another one of these things. And I have a natural interest in figuring out what that's going to be like. Yeah, and, and I guess 2012 would seem like a good candidate back in the day. But we forgot yeah. to uh, clarify the area, because you did clarify the time period of the Mayans, but what sure. what of their area? Yeah, so that pre-classic, classic, and post-classic era takes place it pretty much was discussed as Mesoamerica, and that includes the Aztec region, but essentially that's Mexico, or middle to southern Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, uh, Honduras, sorry, Belize and El Salvador. So, so Middle America, but not yeah. South America itself. Not, not even really Central America. I mean, sort of brushes. I mean, Central America is such a tiny place, like it's yeah. Panama, it's a yeah. skinny little area, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's just north of that, and and um, so it's like the southern, most southern part of, of what would be considered North America. Okay. Yeah. So, what would you say are the mysteries? And uh, we are all familiar, of course, with stuff like um, ancient aliens. And mm-hmm. before you say anything about it, <laughs> let me just let me just explain to you my relationship to that. I usually say to people who are not familiar. Well, today everybody's familiar with it. But I used to say when it was going on, I said, "Watch the show." Because they do a good job, especially uh, the early seasons, in putting focus on actual mysteries, especially in terms of um, structures and ruins and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they do actually give a good, you know, good footage, good explanation. But then when I try to explain everything, it's all back to the same default yeah. Alien, alien, alien. And and that's the part which you don't have to really relate to if, if you're not... All in. Well, I don't. Uh, I don't necessarily believe in aliens per se. No, that's that's what I'm saying. So, so I'm saying ancient aliens. Yeah, we can criticize the show for their explanation, but mm-hmm. I'm not so concerned. I'm more concerned about the way they're focusing, and uh, they too have spoken, of course, of of the Mayans. Mm-hmm. But this is basically the extent of my <laughs> interest as like popular shows and, and dogma. So I want your take on, like, what would you say is re- remaining of the Mayan mysteries? And if it's not alien, then what is this mystery? Well, the astronomy, of course, right, speaks mm. to a high level of scientific capability. The mathematics of that uh, speaks to, you know, refined mathematics. And when you have mathematics and astronomy, you know, you can take your cosmology out into space, whether you actually go there or not, um, physically. Yeah. And and so you have this pictography and iconography of that kind of thing. Like one of the things that they focus on in, in, um, in ancient aliens is the lid of Palenque, which again, is just two and a half hours away. And it's the sarcophagus of, of this uh, Pakal, uh, who was one of the most, um, he's kind of like the Queen Elizabeth <laughs> mm. of the Mayan he lived in and ruled for like 58 years kind of thing. Mm. And his period of rule was considered to be the most uh, fruitful of that era, of that city-state. And sort of uh, depicted on his sarcophagus appears to be, well, there's two versions of it, okay? There's the academic version and then there's the ancient aliens version. And the ancient aliens version is that he's in a spacecraft and he's taking off into space. All right, that one, yeah. And the academic version is that he's falling backwards into the underworld after death. And he's falling along the stalk of the world tree, looking up towards the um, firmament of the other world, which he will eventually go to. Now, those are very divergent (laughs) concepts. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the reason the academics uh, look at it that way is pretty, you know, founded in some pretty sound 
investigation. And the basic cosmology of the Maya is that we live in a tripartite universe. And you're going to, as you hear this, you're going to go, oh, yeah, this is exactly like the Nordic traditions. Mm. So they, they um, you know, which feeds into the whole concept that there's this relationship between the Nordic um, tribes and the Mayans and all of, and all of America, really. Mm. Uh, so... They, we live in a tripartite universe. This is represented in the in the world tree, so the Yggdrasil tree, right? In the Mayan mm-hmm. tradition, is called the Wakachan. And the Wakachan, uh, the way it's uh, sort of divided intellectually, is that we live in the middle world, that middle stock of the tree. And every physical thing that we have in this middle world is a physical chunk of that tree. And that's a very important concept because that's sort of at the root level of what animism is all about. Uh, animism is the concept that everything that is physical has a reflection in the other world above and the underworld below. And we interact with physical aspects, including ourselves and other people and animate objects and creatures through rituals and careful, careful rituals, because we recognize as a species that we can activate either the, the, uh, the dark side or the light side. Right of those reflections through ritual activity. And this, all this is pretty uh, common with other traditions around the world. This is my point, yes. Yeah. This is my point. It's very, very core common. Including even the Norse. Uh, we even call it the mid-world where human lives in ancient Norse uh-huh. mythology. Mm-hmm. We live in the mid-world. That's, that's the name for Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So you have the underworld, you have the overworld, basic shamanic concepts. It's true. Right. And and so what happens after death in the Mayan tradition is that everybody goes into the underworld. Underworld. So yeah. nobody is spared hell. <laughs> mm. There are a few that are spared hell, but it's, it's kind of rare circumstances. Mm. And you can see why later on it becomes a political thing. But um, everybody goes into the underworld. They have to traverse the nine bardos of the underworld in sort of a – those are non-Mayan words. but Yeah, that's Tibetan. Yeah. So essentially – the concept of Jabal. But, but it's, no, it's no wonder because this uh, guru you followed, what was his name? Um, oh, yeah, he was trained by a Tibetan uh, Buddhist, actually. Yeah, exactly. So he saw the correlations and kind of created a universal yeah. concept and laid it over top of my yeah. cosmology. Yeah. Um, so, he, uh, so, they, so they go through the underworld. There's nine levels. Uh, there's nine lords of these dark levels and each level is as you go through it is engineered specifically for you based on what you did or did not do in your lifetime uh, as traps to try and trap your soul and you have to work your way through it and this is all kind of a mythological story that's contained in the Popol Vuh which is why modern academics sort of look at it this way. So Popol Vuh is a Mayan um, transcription of Mayan um, Spirituality, or yeah, yeah. So the Maya, the origin story of the Popol Vuh is that it's. I mean, you can't say uh, with any confidence that it's a unified cosmology because it it does come specifically from the Maya Quiche, hmm. which are near the Lake Atitlan, which is not far from here. It's about another three hours away, and it's the Quiche Maya, which is a different um, tribe and dialect. But uh, when you get into the classic era pictography and iconography it is a unifying aspect of all the different city states Mm. so you can say that it's an origin story that goes back not only there but it also goes all the way back to el mirador and the mirador basin where similar uh cosmology has been unearthed um by richard uh, um, there so anyway getting back to the story so you go through the nine layers of the night and the objective of course is to reach the base of the world tree uh, be reunited with whatever ancestors have already undertaken this heroic journey and may be waiting for you. And then from that point on, you have a celebration, and then you ascend up the stalk of the world tree and become a lamp in the night sky. Mm. It's kind of like the, yeah, right? Mm. And then from there, you take another journey along the white road um, to the center of the universe and uh, disappear into this black spot at the end of the Milky Way. That's a really cosmological concept. There's some other fun- very interesting. It's the same in uh, many other traditions, Pythagorean, Tibetan. They even knew that there was 
uh, it's called different things, but a central sun, a central spot <laughs> in the middle of our galaxy. That's amazing. So, so the uh, mathematics and the astronomy is pretty mind blowing. But what about the structures? Like, uh, was the focus of uh, mm-hmm. ancient aliens? I, I, the structures are also unexplainable, are they not? Well, uh, you're talking about the cities themselves and the pyramids. Yeah, some of these structures show that. I mean, they think it's made by aliens, but <laughs> show that it's an advanced cultural uh, project. Yeah, well, it is definitely advanced. I mean, this is really fairly modern understanding as far as the whole. You know, but could it be? Could it be built by slave labor and whips like they imagine uh, in Egypt? Yeah, well, you know what I like to correlate. Um, the Mayan pyramids around is the whole concept of value and the storage of value. So, you know, we talk about gold, right? It's kind of a traditional storage of value. It has no real, well, it has some intrinsic values, right? Mm. Um, But it's a concept of storage of value. So let's get into that. So here you have pyramids that are being built. Now, it's fairly modern understanding uh, that these Pyramids are arranged according to astronomical phenomena, specifically for the observation and maybe even calculation of those phenomena. So you're not looking at a downtown center the way you do at New York City. You're looking at a downtown center that is is an astronomical clock. Hmm. And every city-state is positioned specifically around where are these alignments. So geodetically on the Earth, uh, it, it, these are the best vantage points for observing very specific astronomical phenomena. And that's why every city-state had its own patron deities, because there were certain astronomical phenomena around very specific bodies in the sky that these alignments occurred around so that they were the best vantage points. So in Tikal, you had Tlaloc and Venus, and in Kalak Mool, you had Mars and and there. Amazing. The same was uh, the case for the Greek and Egyptian uh, paganism. Mm-hmm. So the very this sp- was common practice all over the world, obviously. Yes, this is my point. This is exactly what I'm. Hmm. Um, and you know, this is fairly well known. It's sort of a field. It's called archaeoastronomy. It's kind of a new field. It was considered quack for a while. Now it's not. It's more or less entered into the mainstream. Yeah especially in, in the Mayan world uh, around, uh, say, Susan Milbreth and Anthony Avenue. Uh, those are two that do a pretty good job of explaining it. I would say Susan Milbreth is the better. But then because they're working with inaccurate uh, calendrical sequences, their observations are a bit off, right? Hmm. And this gets back to the fact that we're really still breaking ground when it comes to the calendar and the way these cities work. And that's where Lawrence uh, and his... Um, um, confederates are going to come in and blow people's minds. So, so just back to the concept, these are cities that are built around the idea that you have a tripartite order or tradition of shamans, daykeepers, and noguls. Mm. Everything's in threes, right? You've got the middle world, the underworld, and the other world. Mm. And you've got astronomical um, institutions and shamanic institutions, and then the institutions of transcendent consciousness, which are the noguls. Some people think it's the shaman, but when you get into the mines, it's actually the noguls who sort of take the two. So the shaman is, their purpose in the Mayan culture is to, um, they're kind of like the gardeners, right? They go out and they, they figure out what you can eat and what you can't eat and what are going to blast you off into space as far as like psychedelics are concerned and how that sort of, uh, how you combine those things, right? Cause that's a deep science. That's not mm. just some silly thing. And there's thousands of them. And so they work on that tradition and they're also the medicine men, right? So they actually do practical, they're the physicians, right? Mm. And then, uh, then you have the day keepers, which are the astronomical, timepiece guys. So they actually observe all the astronomical phenomena and they uh, maintain the order and the keeping of days uh, and all that. And then, and they write it down. So they had a a writing system that was more or less destroyed later on. But anyway, Hmm. getting back to that, the noguls combine the two. They're the people who know when, where, and what (laughs) in order to 
blast off into this transcendent consciousness and do magical things mm. that our friend, uh, how do you say his name anyway? Because I've never figured it out. Augustus La uh, Yeah, if it's French, I mean, he, he was Argentinian, right? But mm -hmm. it sounds uh, <laughs> French to me, it is. which would be Plongeon, but Plongeon. I don't know how the Spanish would say it. But anyway. Well, I'm sure he said it in Le Plongeon because it was French and everybody wanted to be French. So, yeah. um, so he, he he was the first one to take the nogulism seriously mm. uh, and to indicate that this is a science that actually was real. And, uh, of course, he got blasted for that. And uh, I don't think he cared, but, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't care. But anyway, he's he, he's the first that I ever found uh, that took it seriously. And that is the idea that through the science of time and place and substance, one could do magical things, mm. seemingly magical things. Mm. Um, and the three together uh, formed a an order, a tripartite order. That was, you know, obviously elevated to its status for the sole purpose of guiding civilization through the trials and tribulations of an animistic society and, um, and governed the, the entire thing. So, mm. so that gets into kind of what the Spanish encountered when they came here. But that peak of that civilization, uh, as far as we know, took place in the ninth century in that middle classic, in the classic era. Mm. And, and lived and breathed in these ancient city-states like Tikal, which I would consider to be the Rome of, of the classic era. Right. And then Kalakmul, which was uh, its sort of main adversary. And, and then back to the bigger picture, I would say there was um, that whole area was the beating heart of a transcontinental trade system that included all uh, indigenous tribes throughout the Americas from the bottom tip, say Patagonia, all the way up to the Eskimos. The reason I say that is because there is, there's not a lot, but there's a, occasionally evidence in burial uh, areas in the north and the deep south that have artifacts that could only be quarried, quarried in the opposite end of the continent. In the what now? Okay, so you have a, let me just say that again. So the, let's say you've got a bury, uh, burial in uh, the Eskimos area, and you have a burial deep down in the south, in the bottom tip of mm. the uh, Argentine, which is called Patagonia. Mm. And they both contain artifacts that could only be made and quarried, that were known to be perfected and quarried in the opposite end of the continent. Right, right, right. Yeah. So this indicates the possibility, at least, of a, of a, a transcontinental trade system and... and uh, you know that kind of thing. So yeah, I was going. I was going to ask you about artifacts too. I mean, there's so much when you regard the old civilizations that really. I mean, there's so many things that just blows to pieces. <laughs> whatever you learn in in uh, the public mainstream schools about yeah, these things, and, and and the artifacts is one of them. I was also going to ask you about these so-called skulls. You know, that's often something people think of when they hear about these things. What do you think about <laughs> these skulls? The what? The skulls. Oh, the skulls. Yeah, the elongated skulls, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Those two, actually. Uh, I was thinking about the crystal skulls. Oh, the crystal skulls. Yeah, that's a mystery. Uh, I don't know what to think about that, to be okay. honest. Okay, uh, fair enough. Because, because... Yeah, they could be the indication of an advanced science. But if that's the case, I think they go much further back. They don't go into the Maya. I think they go into that uh, megalithic uh, era. Hmm. Because there's clear indications in all the megalithic sites of uh, some sort of drilling capacity uh, through the hardest stone. Yeah. Right? Um, and then you have these crystal skulls. And so the way they're explained today, if you think of them as of uh, classic era or even pre-classic era, Mayan origin – then they're either evidence of some carryover of that science that was continued up until that point in time or those two points in time. Right. Or they were rubbed into those formations over a 200 or 250 year period using rudimentary tools. And both could be true, actually. Simply because that they spent hundreds of years making yeah. one skull. Yeah, yeah, I think that could be a traditional aspect. Yes, I think that could be mm. uh, possible. Just because I know how patient 
<laughs> and, yeah. um, and, and uh, rooted in tradition uh, of um, knowledge being passed down and artifacts being passed down as talismans and objects of animistic power, right? Mm. Uh, so that's possible. Both are possible. But I tend to think that just because I've opened my mind, as most of your readers have and you have certainly, of previous global civilizations, and if not global, at least globally connected, Mm. And evidence of extremely uh, advanced science uh, was sort of sitting outside of accepted orthodox academia mm. uh, and just piles and piles of it to the point now where it's it almost outweighs yeah. any kind of, you know. Absolutely. So what about the elongated skulls? you have any take on that? Yeah, the shamanistic stuff. I mean, you know, you get into the um, the physician part of the tripartite um, order I mean, they must have, I mean, I'm speculating, mm. but they must have developed some pretty advanced, you know, <laughs> physiology, right? Mm. And, and you know, and that's a carryover as well, as we know from the Egyptian uh, iconography. You've got elongated heads in the Egyptian iconography, and you've got it in Sumer, and you've got it in all other places. But you actually have physical evidence, like actual skulls of elongated heads that aren't just mm. the result of... Where, of binding them, yeah, of binding. They're they're mm. physically they're physical anomalies. Yeah, I don't know how to explain it because I just don't know. Mm. But I create a, a, an explanation. It's a complete fiction that I've created in my novel. But you know, they they use, you want to you want to give a um, spoiler for that? Not really, but I do. <laughs> Just because it's really sexy. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah I, that's what I mean. I mean, uh, that could be a teaser, you know. Yeah, well, I, I kind of want to be on here to tease people. So, so uh, yeah, anyway, I create an explanation for it, and it, and it revolves around uh, precision tools based on obsidian glass. Mm. Say that. Mm. And also the name lineage of some of these uh, um, uh, classic era kings and queens who – whose skulls these are, by the way, mm. when you get into who these skulls are, and there's really not a lot of information about this. In fact, it's very suppressed, yeah, deeply suppressed, actually, um, to the point where there's almost nothing on the Internet, which is really amazing, right? When you can suppress it out of the Internet, then there's real effort being made. Mm. Uh, so there are a lineage of kings and queens around the 6th century of uh, the Maya uh, classic era, uh, so 6th century A.D., 600 years after Christ, in the city-states of Tikal, Palenque, Copan, um, Calakmul, Caracol, and a few others that are sort of sub-fiefdoms of those major city-states, where these elongated heads were dug up. Mm. And they are not humanoid, really, because there's really a lot more skull material there than should exist if they're human, Right. Well, well, well. They may not be human, but they are humanoid, indeed. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like yeah. they're clearly human, but they're not, mm. as we understand it, anatom anatomically. They, they they may belong to an ancient race too, because I mean, people think ethnicity is diverse now. Mm. Oh my God! <laughs> if, if you go back in time, um, there was much more variations between people, and indeed, the Neanderthals, as we've been saying again and again in so many shows, were human. They were just a uh, uh, sub-species yeah. of the human species. And same goes for the well, for the similar kind of tribes or whatever you want to call it, that anthropological... Um, well, what they used to try to exclude from the human family, but which now has to be integrated. So, yeah, we had hobbits, <laughs> we had uh, giants. And so, yeah, why wouldn't we have people with weird skulls too? Yeah. <laughs> There's even a skull with horns on it. Well, think of it in terms of a, a strange surgery. Yeah, but these are, like you said, these are not just strange surgery, right? So... Oh, no, no, there's evidence that it could be, yeah. Because there's fusion, there's skull fusion. Yes, some of them are are from this practice where they try to shape the head. But I, no, no, I, no, 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 no. Imagine putting 
a second skull, cutting open the skull. Oh. Planting a second brain over top of the other one. Now, whose brain would you do that with? Jeez. You'd do that with your... It, it's like you get into the whole concept of, of Mayan cosmology and you get this whole veneration of the ancestors that is so deep. So you would take your father's brain? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Wow. That's a new... That's a mind-blowing. I never heard that before. Yeah, well, that's a spoiler. So again, it's right. fiction. I mean, it's like just my imagination, but right. this is based on some fact. Right, right. right. And it's based on a, on a fact of, of a, what I would consider to be a fairly deep understanding of their veneration of the ancestors right. and how that works. Mm. Right? What is one of the most frustrating aspects of our lifetime is the fact that we just get wise enough to understand how life works and then we die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah, we should. I mean, if we had like 200 years, I think that could be enough. Well, what if you conceptually could inherit your ancestors' knowledge in a literal fashion? Yeah, but you still waste so much time in um, the first 20, 25 years, right? At least in this culture. I mean, what if you could put your father's brain on your head and the brains would fuse and you would actually have access to their understanding post-death? Mm. Yeah. That's sort of the concept I play with. Mm. And there's reasons for it. And it's kind of a perversion in a, that takes place in a certain period of time. Yeah, yeah, you know, let's let's get more into that in part two. Yeah. It sounds very creative and interesting. Mm -hmm. But let's uh, complete the Mayan thread before we uh, take a break. Sure. So the skulls and all that stuff, that's, um, you know, that belongs to some of the more, ta uh, should I say, folk mystique. Mm. But when we talk about the mystery of the Mayans, I'm guessing we're also referring to Mysticism uh, and uh, mystery in its original sense doesn't mean weird phenomena and unexplainable facts. It actually refers to uh, kind of a spiritual approach, a more direct approach to the numinous. Mm -hmm. I, I guess that has an aspect in this uh, usage that you, you use it for at least uh, the Maya mysteries. I guess that's an aspect too. I mean, shamanism and stuff like that. Yeah, well, the name of the novel series is Mystics of the Maya, which mm. obviously is mysticism. <laughs> mm. And the mystics, right? The mystics. Um, mm. The Palenque Roundtable, and then who contributed to the modern understanding of Mayan shamanism traditions and so on. So getting back to kind of the origin of that and, and who provides the best information uh, that I base all of this on sort of goes back to two things. Earlier, we were talking about the uh, Palenque Roundtable, but I didn't really sort of flesh that out. Mm -hmm. So the Palenque Roundtable was this event. And like I said before, uh, Mayan study had sort of, you know, it ran up against a, a rock wall, if you will. They couldn't read the Mayan script. And so in, in Palenque in uh, 1973, December, I forget exactly what the dates were, but it was 73. It was in December. It was kind of a spur of the moment thing. And it was kind of an effort of a multidisciplinary effort. Okay? And that's why I thought you'd love it, because it kind of, for a moment, um, went way outside of academic tradition where you have all the orthodoxy determining who and can, who can and who cannot come together and study something, right? Mm. Um, this was kind of an open door thing where they had universities from all over come by and disciplines of various types. I uh, can't speak off the top of my head exactly what they were, but, you know, art history and Mayan archaeology and, you know, all these other disciplines. And they came together and it was really in that meeting and the results of those meetings uh, in 73 that the Rosetta Stone for the Mayan script started to form. Mm. And a lot of it is based on the work of a character that I spoke about, or I can't remember if I mentioned his name, but it's uh, Diego de Landa. And this is where my novel starts. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I won't get into that yet. So essentially what happened is they started to understand a little bit better the phonetics of this epigraphy, and they started to understand what were numbers and what were vowel sounds and what were, you know, concepts right in a mm. epigraphic form and there's other words for that but essentially in the, in the epigraphy and 
it's really been since then that uh, systematically all the different um, glyphs that are represented not only in the, uh, the classic era uh, city-states and inscribed in stone, but also in all the pottery right, that's been discovered. Mm. They had um, really uh, beautiful pottery and, of course, painted on there um, all these different uh, mythological imagery. Uh, so... Really, the answer to your question of who contributed the most to the understanding of Mayan shamanism is the Mayans. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the point I want to bring up because this goes back to also that, that series that I was discussing earlier called uh, Legends of a Lost Civilization and then previous to that, the Divine Archive. <laughs> you know, there's all these new agey kind of people out there, especially around 2012, sort of pontificating uh, about this, that, and the other thing and, and not really giving a lot of credit to where they got their ideas mm. and where they were getting their ideas were from the Maya. Mm. And, and uh, the Maya depict in eloquent detail, in, in enormous tone of, of uh, epigraphic and pictographic and iconographic record, these very, very paranormal looking um, and supernatural appearing concepts in stone and on pottery. And it's really from them that, uh, that I started to understand and, and sort of break apart and come up with this tripartite order and their various uh, duties and positions and how they related to each other and, and started to form kind of this picture of who they might have been, right? Mm. I'm not going to say that I understand it completely because uh, that would be stupid. But, 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 but what is the tripartite order of yeah, the Mayan priesthood? It's the, uh, the shaman, the daykeepers, and the noguals. The shamans, the daykeepers, and the what now? The noguals. Okay, noguals. Do you okay. know what noguals are? No, I have no idea. I'm probably not 99% okay. of the listeners either. <laughs> okay, so let's get into that. So back, so just covering that, um, that issue... Uh, the tripartite. So the shamans, again, are kind of your physicians. Mm. They're your medicine men. And they also make a science of all the different, you know, and by nature of that position, they understand all the uh, potions and mm. herbology and combination of, uh, you know, things in the forest and everything else that will help with right. not only um, uh, health and wellness, but uh, sourcing all these psychedelic um, substances. Mm. And they do take them but not to the degree that noguls do. So then you have the daykeepers, who are the astronomers and the mathematicians. So they observe astronomy and they maintain the order of the days. And they, um, you could even say, you could speculate that they were also the masons because they instructed the construction of their city-states, which again, I'd mentioned earlier, were all based around these astronomical observations. So they were timepieces. That's what these city-states were. They were buildings constructed specifically for the observation of astronomical phenomena along predictable mathematical uh, calendrical systems. And, um, and then using that information to elevate themselves into kind of a status of a, of a magician. right? Because you've got, the, mm. you've got the, um, the common people who, you know, <laughs> ignorant of these things. And, and yep. you know that that division is maintained on purpose, and then you have this. Oh. The initiates. Yeah. But who are the Naguals? So the Naguals are supposedly folklore, right? Religion. Mm. It's a human being who has the power to shape shift into various animal forms. You know, it's been demonized, right? Um, mm. It's a widespread superstition, right? That um, mm. Naguals made packs with the devil. Uh, you know, and all that kind of crap. But the reality is that they were the ones who combined place, time, and substance in order to, um, and substance I mean by uh, the um, tradition of psychotropic drugs, uh, mm. at various places according to the astronomy, at various specific times according to the mathematics of the calendar, in order to perform... So, so they were psychonauts? They were psychonauts, exactly. Very good word. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, okay. psychonauts. Because you see, th this three divi division that you're operating with here is the same in other ancient spiritual traditions. Mm -hmm. 
Precisely. So, so that's very fascinating. Yeah. I'm learning so much about the Mayans now because everything you tell me, I can just it falls into place when I perceive it from the filter of the stuff I already know. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. it's it's just amazingly similar. <laughs> it is amazing, isn't it? I mean, that is one of the first things that struck me as I began this journey because, like you, I've been involved in you know, studying Eastern mysticism, the, the Vedic tradition. No. <laughs> I never, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> oh. I never would <coughs> claim that I studied Eastern mysticism. Well, you know, I've studied Western, Western mysticism is my strong point. Well, you have a cursory. But, but that, that's, you know, if it goes prior to the Abrahamic religions, mm-hmm. it's completely the same as in, for example, in Europe, all the pagan traditions has nothing to do with Vicca and that modern invention bullshit. It's the same as Hinduism, basically. And Hinduism is just uh, an umbrella term for all sorts of ancient spiritual traditions. So within Hinduism, you'll find very conflicting stuff, stuff that doesn't even go together. Mm-hmm. So it's just an umbrella. People think Hinduism is a name of a religion. No, it's a name of a form of worship, mm-hmm. which is pre-monotheism. And it was the same in Greece in Scandinavia, in Egypt, in Celtic, in Germanic, etc. But it's not just the way they organize this stuff that's the same. It's it's also down to doctrines, insights into... Because unlike New Age, which is very unpractical, <laughs> this stuff, including the Mayan stuff, is very practical. It's very tied up to reality. Like you say, mathematics, astronomy, herbs, uh, all sorts of stuff that people related to and had access to in in those times. So it's the same all over the world in the broad essence of stuff. Sure, there may be some symbolic differences, some uh, terminology differences, of course, different language, different cultures, and, and also different areas with time specializes in aspects of what survived from the pre ice age Mm -hmm. civilization. For example, the Babylonians and the Sumerians went very far in terms of astronomy, Mm -hmm. astrology. Other cultures could go further in architecture or in in alchemy. So yeah, there may be traits that are more identified with one culture than another. But bottom line they had access to the same lore. Mm-hmm. And I had a chap on called Timothy Hogan, who is uh, a Neo Templar, and he's been traveling a lot to different cultures. And he, he, he noticed in, I don't know if you listened to our show about the elements. Yeah, I did. Okay, both parts? Oh, uh, it's been a while, so I can't remember if I, I remember. Well, I think in part two, I think he mentioned how down to the keys in the rituals, he was in the in the jungle. He, he's visited Mayans, all, all sorts of natives all over the Americas, and it's the same goddamn secrets. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I boil it down to is that the average viewer, if you you know, if the average person was to come across one of these rituals mm. in the daylight without any sort of preamble or preparation. Mm. Out of context, right. Out of context, it would just look like a bunch of nonsense, right? Yeah. And yeah. and it would just look like a bunch of superstitious nonsense and a bunch of talismans and icons and all these things that are being used all across the world that just, from a 3D reality, don't make any sense. Yeah, sure. As would, as would the Catholic Mass. Oh, this is your body. This is your blood. I mean, yeah. what kind of morbid? Uh, <laughs> oh, a dead man on a cross. Let's get out of here. These are Satanists. <laughs> right. Exactly. Transmogrification. Right. However, from a transcendent state of consciousness, which is not easy to achieve, you have to take hmm. special preparations. You have to go through extreme trials of endurance. You have to. Uh, be brave enough to even endure some intense pain and then mm. take the psychedelic uh, substances and then you perform the ritual at the right time. From that perspective, mm. within that state of mind, things are seen and observed that the average mundane perception cannot see. Mm. And and this is sort of at the root of all these traditions that have been demonized and shoved aside. And yet, I think, are at the pinnacle of 
our world order, mm. the people who are at that, who are in that uh, club, if you will, mm. uh, have maintained these things and kept them for themselves by virtue of demonizing them throughout history and making them their own. Mm. So I think they do live on, but they don't um, live on in the collective consciousness uh, because they're sequestered and kept out of sight, just as they were back in the in any. Uh, yeah, history. which is wise. All esoteric traditions keep their head low and under the radar, especially today, when the surveillance state, when the materialists, the evil psychopaths ruling this world, has so many ways to tap into almost innermost sacred and secret spaces. I mean, sure. any guardians of ancient secrets need to up the game in order, because imagine, you know, the more tangible stuff the leaders of the world, the leaders of the world, I mean, those who are running the world get hold of, the worse it is, right? So they're obliged to keep a sacred space away from prying eyes yep. so that's good well there's good and there's bad right there's the white hats and the black hats if you will i don't think that things are so black and white it's, everything's nuanced but you know within that group, within the mayan too uh yeah because you have competing city states right yeah but but all there would you say there are mayan spiritual mayan traditions or, or let's not even use the word spiritual because mm -hmm. if you go back in time uh, in the case of the mayans too there's no really no difference between, you know, spiritual is a, is a word we can use today because we have divided the matter from spirituality. It's just existentialism, basically. <laughs> That's well, what it is, right? But would you say, sorry, would you say that within the Mayan existentialism, that there are a, a tradition, a, a stream, a lineage that is intended destruction, uh, that's like, quote unquote, evil, that seeks um you know uh, something negative in their own view let's, let's let's recontextualize that whole question let's okay use the word animism as our foundation mm -hmm. animism does not distinguish between good and evil it's just in terms of bad or good it's light and dark forces they just are yeah. they exist they just are it's not a moral judgment Mm -hmm. And it's the belief that all animate objects and inanimate objects within this middle realm have both aspects contained within them mm -hmm. and can be activated and must be activated at different times. It's just like how the Bible says for every season, there is a time for war, a time for this, that and the other thing, right? Similar cosmology in the sense that they didn't distinguish good and evil. They just, in terms of a moral condition, they just understood that both exist and have to be dealt with. Mm. And so the way we would, uh, in a modern context, especially a modern ideological context, draw clear lines of good and evil the way people are doing now <laughs> is um, non-existent in an animist. Yeah, but, but, but I, I put evil in quotes. But what I was getting at was that... Mm -hmm. uh, Rarely you will find a spiritual tradition who says that we want to do destruction. Yeah. Yeah, you can acknowledge destruction as a force yep. that is necessary. Sometimes it can do good, mm -hmm. what we perceive to be good. Some bad things get destroyed. Excellent, right? Yeah. Carly in her best uh, manifestation. But I was getting uh, around to the question if there's a lineage that is deliberately representing the dark side, if you like, no, the Sith Lords of Mayans. No, I don't think so. I mean, if you're going to get into that whole sort of labeling, you would call the Nogules that, right? Ah, right, right. But, right, right. Uh, but that's not really the case because their purpose was to experience a vision and bring that vision back as a guiding principle for the collective vision. What do Nogul mean? Noguls, again, are those... Um, no, no, but what does the word mean? Like the actual literal translation? Yeah, because uh, one class is called day keepers. That's obviously a translation. I was just wondering if you could, if yeah, it's yeah, possible. It's to... literally the word that is used to describe those in the tripartite order that are the ones who are the shapeshifters and get into transcendental conscious or transcendent consciousness. That's a function, but the word does not mean. Do we know what it means? You know what? Why don't you ask Lauren? 
Yeah, I will. Because it's weird that they say day keepers and then they, then they say nagwals. Why wouldn't they have traditional words for both? Well, they do, but uh, you know, <laughs> it's right. They do, right? So, so why don't yeah. they translate all three? Well, they do, but again, there's 32 dialects uh, just in the okay. Mayan tradition, and then you have all the mm. traditions of the Toltec and the Aztec. I mean, if you want to get into the word that they use for every single one, yeah. we could spend all day on that. So, but the, essentially, the universal meaning is magician and the person who is capable or the practitioner of transformation. Physical transformation. Right. You mentioned um, the Toltec. You know Don Miguel Ruiz, who wrote some very popular books. What was it called? Uh, I have several of them. I can't even remember what they're called. <laughs> <laughs> but pretty basic philosophy, but based on the Toltec. He claims he is for, of a Toltec lineage. He says that the Toltecs wasn't a tribe. He says it was a priesthood, basically, and it's a class of initiates. Mm -hmm. It was basically an esoteric order, like the tripartite order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, so, so you agree with that statement then? I don't agree or disagree. I can't say because that's not my uh, field of expertise. Right. You know, I'm uh, I'm a Mayan. Um, I focus on the Maya and to a certain degree uh, the Aztec or what became the Aztec, the sort of origin of the Aztec uh, that existed around uh, Teotihuacan in that that um, central period, that uh, classic era. I'm just wondering if the Toltecs is the same as the tripartite order, or if it's just an alternative version. I think that the Toltecs were a people because the mm. the order must have governed a certain group of people, which they did. Yeah, exactly. At very at very specific cities. And in the post classic era they did take over what is known as Chichen Itza by an act of war. Mm. Um mm. and you know, brought about uh their peak in the um in the post classic era. So mm. there's all kinds of mix uh, mixing going on, right? Mm. As I pointed out earlier, there were um, even areas of around Teotihuacan, which was a city uh, focused around that ceremonial center, uh, that had suburbs that were all Mayan people from Tikal, for instance. Mm. Uh, so, you know, it operated very similarly to today in the sense that, you know, you have migratory groups of people coming to Canada and, say, landing in Calgary right. and forming very specific suburbs of Calgary, right? Mm. The only difference that uh, at the center is the economic center as opposed to the Mayan, which was a astronomical slash shamanistic slash supernatural um, mm. place. And that got back to why they built pyramids. That was another question you asked that we never really fleshed out. Yeah. And I said uh, that they were, it gets into the concept of, value, of uh, storage of value. So where today we have gold, for instance, that is a storage of value and we have fiat currency and all that, you know, uh, it is a magical concept, right? Because it's just by collective acceptance that these things have value. Mm. Similar in the Maya tradition, these city-states, even though they were built as um, you know, astronomical centers, they were reskinned every 20 years, every cartoon period um, with a new layer. And every 52 years and every 104 years and so on. Mm. And that meant that they were actually building up their storage of value, supernatural value, power, literally, mm. Mm. Uh, on a cyclical basis. Um, very similar to the way you would stockpile gold, for instance, or, um, you know, at this, in this modern day, you might look at Bitcoin, for instance, uh, as, a, as a massive storage of value because it has a finite um, amount and because uh, it's an ever increasing demand mm. and so similar with these city states you know the way they sort of negotiated power between them and, and, and politicized that power was by virtue of their construction efforts mm. and those mm. construction efforts were a suppository of, of um, power and, of course, in the collective conscience of those people who were the um, uh, citizens of those places, they spent a lot of time and energy investing in the buildup of that power by continuously adding to their construction, which is why they have kind of like a layered approach. So that explains that. Mm -hmm. Back to the cosmology. Now, the other thing about that is that they use stone, right? So they use stone to build. Mm -hmm. And they believe that stone was the physical bark of that world tree. 
But that indicates, you know, all the stone builders are a trait of the first manifestation of the post-apocalyptic uh, uh, era. So yeah. uh, if you go back to Gebek Litepe, you know, 12,000 years, this indicates that the origins of the Mayans are at least 12,000 years old. At least. That's, that's where how, I... how far would you go? Well, the Mayans, if you're going to say that they go back that far, they must go back even further because they would have been a continuation of a previous civilization exactly. that was much older. So, you know, you could yeah. go 20,000 and 30,000. And in fact, mm. that goes back to what we discussed earlier, that the modern anatomical human is what? What was your timeline? I said 146. Not mine, but the latest admission from uh, what they admit, because they want to keep us as young as possible, right? But now they're down to 250,000. Right. Uh, in terms of our biology not having changed. With one exception, there's a new blood type that manifested around 2,000 years ago. Hmm. Where was uh, but, but other than that, uh, we are biological identical. Yeah, so that, that gets back to the, the whole thing. I think the mind... Yeah, that's A, A, B, if you asked which one. Did you ask which one? Yeah, where where was that? Oh, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe the Middle East. I don't know if they know where it emerged, but uh, they know which one it is. It's the AB. Okay, so there you go. So I think that, you know, it's pretty clear because humans are a continuous species. <laughs> Mm. Like we just disappear and then come back all of a sudden. Yeah, we're we're a continuation of all these civilizations. That's how I look at it. That's what I call indigenous mm. mind. We are a continuation mm. of uh, genetic material that uh, contains all this information, and mm. that is tr really what the shaman and the nagils are doing. Is they're tapping into that information that is inborn. Mm. That's what I. That's my belief. I believe. Mm based on my own personal experiences and also what I've discovered in this lengthy, will probably be a lifetime study, has already been a fairly, almost more than half my life. Um, well, it has been more than half my life. Um, that, that this is, this is the, the science of tapping into the just lineage of history that is contained in our genetic code through these traditions. And the gateway drug being, you know, all these different psychedelics mm -hmm. and the tradition of using um, extreme trials of endurance in order to shatter the conscious mind in order to dive deep into the subconscious mind where all this stuff exists. Mm. So that's that's what I think is behind all that. And that's what I literalize in my novel. That's essentially the I extrapolate on that to great depth, that core concept. Mm. And, um, and get into it that way. Uh, so essentially any science that may have occurred or any understanding astronomical that may have occurred in some antiquity, whatever, wherever it occurred, if it exists in your lineage, if it exists in your genetic material, you can tap into it and you don't need the apparatus that originally... But, but that wouldn't only be true for big traumas like cataclysm. It would probably be true for other yeah. basic human experiences too. Exactly. Everything. Everything mm. is contained in there. But of course, the big shakeups are the ones that are really pronounced. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and that's where you get your reckoning of time. It's just a really long process, you know, with the occasional quantum leap forward by virtue of technology that appears for a period of time in human history and catapults human understanding in certain fields uh, forward, but then gets in, you know, downloaded, if you will, into the genetic material. Mm. Which is why, you know, when you have these uh, people who talk about this genetic material and how certain things appear to be deactivated or not functioning or not activated, uh, whether it be parts of the brain or certain aspects of the genetic code, the double helix that don't appear to be active. This is, I think, what accounts for that, is that you, you need to tap into those things, and the way to do it is through this tradition, which has more or less been kept from us, the shaman mm. tradition. Do they have a concept of reincarnation? Yeah, they do, actually. Uh, so mm. it's not as pronounced as, say, uh, you know, the Buddhist philosophy, but it's there. It exists in the idea of the traversing of the underworld, right? So when you die... Mm. And you um, go into the underworld and you reach the base of the world tree. Not always do you ascend into the other world. Sometimes you return to the middle world. Mm. 
because you don't get all the way up the stock because it's all uh, it's all kind of a you know it's how we we understand knowledge and we understand um, wisdom it's like you need a certain amount in order to get so far right but if you regard how all the ancient traditions were keeping such a weight on the ancestors mm -hmm. revering and worshiping then it kind of indicates a possibility for the notion of reincarnating within your own bloodline. Yeah, there's that. There's also the possibility that you just never die, right? Because death is not death the way we understand it today. It's like it's a, you know, when you die, supposedly physically, you don't really die. You just go into the underworld. Well, that's a whole other life. Mm. And then, and then you ascend the world tree. Well, that's a whole other journey. And then you get to the other world above, and and you know that's a right. that journey that lasts according to the calendar millions of years. Mm. You know, so there's there's really no finite concept of life within the Mayan tradition that that uh, that exists. It's really infinite. And that mm. infinity is represented very well in their calendrical system because the numbers they use are so vast when you get up above the uh, Bakhtun periods into the Pikmin yeah. and all these others. I mean, we're talking millions of years. Mm. And that's why that's why there's a real similarity between the calendars and these, these yugas and all that stuff, right? Even billions of years. Yeah. They, they, even, exactly. they even describe the age of the universe. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that itself is a cycle that that, uh, that is a cyclical thing. It's not which which, by the way, has been verified. You know, there's some scientists who who are open to these things, and uh, like uh, Fritz of Capra, he wrote the Tao of Physics. So when you look into the counting system of the Indians, mm -hmm. the Hindu Indians, not the native, then uh, you will see that there are so many. Uh, aspects of their law which fits modern scientific uh, discovery mm -hmm. obviously in cases where it's clear cut there's so much based on interpretation right that you can get the, like the whole 2012 thing mm -hmm. basically a bad interpretation of a real science right? Right. Absolutely. gone wrong <laughs> in this case gone wrong well, it's a reflection of our modern consciousness. That's how I look at it. It's like we're just we're at that place as a collective species. We we look in these terms. And the, and the updated date was two thousand and eighty five. Did you say? Uh, yes, it's two thousand and eighty seven. Eighty seven. So you and me. Twenty five years. Add seventy five years to twenty twelve. Basically. Yeah. So so you and me may not be around to see that based on what's going on right now i don't know if i want to be around for the next 10 years jesus <laughs> <laughs> well there's always going to be a space on the globe which is better it depends where you are right <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. never has the entire globe been dark at the same time well i wouldn't say never it was probably so after the cataclysm yeah that must be now a horrible time to live <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, building everything up from the ground. They did a good job, though. I mean, we if it was me and you, we would have straw huts, right? But those <laughs> guys built stone monuments. <laughs> so refined. Yeah, well, that's why I like Graham Hancock's concept of uh, species and amnesia, right? Mm. And that fit really well with the concept of tapping into this um, genetic material, the encoded history of our ancestors that is contained within all of us. Right. And and uh, tapping into it through this tradition, which has been lost deliberately, I think. Yeah. So so you could say just to help people understand that many of the techniques that are used in, um, for example, in shamanism and, and ancient esoteric and spiritual traditions, mm -hmm. has to do with decoding much of the stored knowledge, if not memories, uh, the essence. You know, they, they they said you you can't take anything with you into death except love and wisdom. Mm -hmm. So if you can unlock some of that stuff through these techniques, you're doing it organically. You're doing it through the consciousness, through the psyche. Yeah. Then you have scientists today who want to unlock the same kind of thing and do unlock it, right? But through matter, they unlock coded information through matter. But it, it's kind of the spiritual aspect of that we're talking about. 
Yeah, they're just looking at it from a 3D material perspective. But what they're looking at is something that can only be accessed through this transformational consciousness. Yeah. Um, you know, they have ideas that they can you know, play around with it. And maybe they're right. Maybe they actually have that, that uh, capability at this point. If they do. We don't know about it. Um, they may be using it against us. I don't know. I mean, that gets into the whole other thing. So, mm. so, the, so the calendar units, you know, they go from the kin, which is a single day, all the way to the, and I don't know if I actually spell, uh, say this right, but the Alatun, which is um, 23 billion, 40 million days, so roughly 63 million years. And then it all starts again. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> You know, the, the calendar system and this whole eschatological fascination with the end date scenario is, uh, is just, a, it's just a fear of death thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and very, very Abrahamic, very like salvation. I mean, America, there's no, it's no coincidence that the hysteria was strong as there because of the evangelic traditions, right? Uh, and these yeah. bullshit notions of <laughs> doomsday, judgment day which is really more a modern interpretation of, of Christianity than a, a real original Christian interpretation. And the thing about, you know, like Jehovah's Witnesses and all, all these Protestantic sects who thinks that there will be some sort of all or nothing. It's like now everything will be... Be resolved. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, once and for all. Yeah. Uh, and we won't go back to... And obviously there's no such notion in in the Mayan. But what, what would you say is the Mayans' take on the significance of being in a transition zone between two... Not just two time periods, but even the biggest one. Because they, we, that's what we're talking about, right? A Bakhtun is the biggest? No, no. A Bakhtun is 20 Katun, which is about 144,000 days. Um, and there's 13 Bakhtuns in an age, uh, which is essentially the 5,200-year cycle. Um, so, so uh, and it's entire 2,000-year cycle that's going to end in 2087, right? Not, not just... It's a 13 Bakhtun period that's ending in 2087. The last Bakhtun. Yeah, the 13th Bakhtun, that's right. The 13th. When did that begin? Of the, of the current age, right? And there's five ages in the long count. Right. Uh, we're in the fifth age, uh, according to... So, so which age are we in now? The fifth. The fifth age. The last one. The last one of this particular long count. <laughs> right, so, right. So which is called a Calabtoon, which is um at which there are twenty in a or sorry, thirteen in a in a Kinichel tune, which is there are thirteen in a Lala tune. So, you know, again it just goes bigger. This is identical to, to Indian and Greek, but uh so we are at the end of the fifth did you say? Yep, the fifth creation cycle in our modern, if you want to call it modern, uh, by Mayan interpretation, um, long count sequence of long counts, which is five of long counts. Which in so when did that start? The one we're in now. The one started now is in three thousand one hundred and fourteen BC. I think it's August fourteenth uh, oh, oh. or August thirteenth, something like that. Uh, that's off the top of my head. It might be thirteenth or fourteenth. I can't remember exactly. Oh, it's August eleventh. Actually, I just looked it up. So August eleventh, three thousand one hundred fourteen BC in the Gregorian calendar. Or so about five thousand years for one. Five thousand by the incorrect tabulation, it's five thousand one hundred and something years. Mm. Uh, but by the correct tabulation, it is 5,200 Mayan years, which if you, the way they uh, account for the fractions is that they wait for the 260, day, again, this is Lauren's domain, basically the 260-day 260, uh, 260 calendar and the 365-day calendar minus that fraction of two point, uh, 0.2424 days, that slippage in time corrects itself by virtue of the syncopation between the 365-day calendar and 260-day calendar, which is a, a fractal miracle. And then when you extrapolate <laughs> on that through the uh, cosmos, as uh, Lauren will point out, 
the this 1320 time that uh, is at the core this 260 day calendar uh, is uh, is just repeated uh, over and over again and is absolutely precise in determining everything from the, uh, the Venus synodical cycle to, you know, the furthest star or the nearest star to just so many things. It's unbelievable. Mm. Mm. And, and I'm going to just leave it at that because he's so interesting. To yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. talk with him. But uh, what, what do they believe is the significance of being present in such a period? Well, if you go into their sort of theology and you get into the um, uh, Popol Vuh, the gods, the deities, of which there is one uh, that... Will return to Earth? No. No. No, what happened is the deity wanted to experience itself, right? Mm. And therefore wanted to create things in order to have a reflection of itself. And in so doing, broke apart into all these different components Mm. And then tried to create a being that could recognize it all. Mm. And so through the five ages, there's these creation events that take place on these 5,200-year um, intervals, of which we're in the fifth one. And the previous versions are all attempts at creating what is commonly understood as the human being. <laughs> mm. Mm. And, and various uh, destructions occur because the creation is not proper, doesn't have the ability to do what the creator intended. Mm. And so, you know, it goes through a cycle and let's just talk about the last three. So they try and create humanity out of various substances. One, it's mud and then it's wood and then it's, you know, different things, right? And these, these are symbols. Yes, this is all symbolic. Exactly. Mm. And so it's, it's a theology, right? Yeah, but the story, the theology is identical with, uh, for example, Tibetan and mm -hmm. others too. They say the same thing. God wants to experience itself. Right. Through. Exactly. This is the commonality. Again, this is the commonality. This yeah. is why it's so great. Absolutely. This is why it's so great to understand the commonality between all these things because it really points to the existence of previous global civilizations, and these are the evidence of that. Mm. Um, mm. But anyway, back to the story. So, so they try and create humans in various forms, and they just don't seem to work out. The one that creates in mud, they're kind of stupid. They walk around, they make a bunch of noise, but nothing really happens. So God <laughs> creates it, uh, destroys it, and I forget if it's a flood or a or fire, and it sort of goes back and forth between flood and fire. Right. And then uh, in the second version, it's the um, the, uh, the wood people. And the wood people are more enlightened, but they sort of get self-enamored with their, their tools. Mm. <laughs> This is interesting. They get so enamored with their tools, they forget to pay attention to gods, to the gods who create mm. them. And so the gods rise their tools up against them. To destroy them, and then eventually, their the tools actually attack their their creators, which are the people, and mm. and then a flood occurs, and the um, the last incarnation of those people end up. So, so the Mayans also have the notion that the world has been destroyed over and over again by different cataclysms. Yes, mm. this is an indigenous concept. This came out of the Quiche Maya when um, Bartolomeu de las Casas came to them and tried to preserve some of their um, culture in the wake of all this destruction that was going on in the uh, 16th century. So they translated the Quiche origin story into what is called the Popol Vuh, and the Popol Vuh stands as kind of the only yeah. real post-classic era version of what you could call their Bible. Mm their creation myths and all their mythological tales. And this entire story that I'm talking about is contained within that book. So which which uh, destruction are we due for now in 85 or whatever? Well, this is the interesting thing. So let's continue the story. So at some point, uh, at the beginning of this current age, which is, again, 3,114 B.C., August 11th, um, according to the Gregorian calendar, mm. The previous incarnations were destroyed, and then God broke up into even more uh, components. And they all got together and discussed how they were going to create the next version of human beings and what was going to give them the insight necessary in order to not only observe the existence of God, but venerate it properly. Mm. And this leads to the conclusion that God would have to sacrifice a part of itself. 
in order to imbue human beings with that insight. Mm. And so the, uh, so this is being discussed among all the animals and the vegetables and the trees and everything else, which are all the component pieces of God. And it is decided, uh, actually, corn volunteers. Corn. Corn. <laughs> yeah, okay. Volunteers yeah. to be sacrificed and, and it's insight, it's godly component be uh, inserted into the next creation. And that's what happened. Mm-hmm. And so the modern Maya are born. That's their creation story. Now, uh, and were they agricultural, uh, big on ag- agriculture? Yeah, they're, yeah they, they literally venerated corn. And actually, this gets into really a mind-blowing aspect of the collapse of the Maya in the ninth century. And this is why it's so important to set the stage for this. Um, because it's just a phenomenal, uh, amazing aspect of what would bring about the collapse of such a sophisticated society. Anyway, uh, this corn god sacrifices himself, and here we are in the modern age, and they venerate corn, and their staple uh, agricultural uh, science is based around corn and squash and a few other things that they actually created um, through the long process of taking seeds and turning them into a refined form of uh, crop, right? Genetic manipulation, essentially. Mm. Uh, and corn is one of them. They created chocolate. They created squash. They created avocado. They created quite a few things that we that we um, consider to be some of the best things to eat today. Anyway. The Mayans did? Yeah. Yeah. The Mayans did, yeah. Mm. So, uh, so their contribution to the agricultural uh, archive of humanity is, is great as well. Wow, yeah. Indeed. Along Indeed. with uh, along with the uh, the calendar, avocado alone is a great claim to <laughs> exactly. superiority. Yeah, yeah, guacamole, right? And uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, tortillas and you know all that good stuff. Everything you can do with corn. Um, so that's the age that we're in, and you know it's really difficult to tag a, a destruction myth to the end of the calendar because they really didn't put a lot of focus in such a far distant time. It was occasionally referenced to in astronomical terms in terms of the rise and fall of these deities in the sky, which is what the 2012 end date notation is about. It's uh, it's an obscure... In other words, 2087. And now it's 2087 when you consider and tal- uh, tabulate the days out of time. Hmm. And it would have been that date, 2087, the Gregorian calendar, but they didn't include those days because they considered them days out of time. Mm. And it was a mathematical formula that caused them to do that. It was a way of reconciling all these slippages in time through all these fractions. Mm. Again, this is just the genius of Lauren. Um, so I'll let you get into him. I'm really setting up the stage for him. Mm. But um, but that's sort of where we're at. It's like we don't really know, right? Uh, because the Maya didn't conceptualize, so to speak, or we don't know of anyway, mm. what was going to occur other than we'd had four previous ages that ended in cataclysms. The logical assumption is there's a cataclysm of some kind. And that may be the case, but they didn't really uh, spend a lot of time visualizing it in – in terms of their inscribed history. And the bulk of their inscribed history is in that classic era period in the Maya Paten region with all those ancient city-states with the uh, the actual writing system encased in them, as well as their pottery and all the other stuff that's been found in those areas. Uh, And they didn't really, to my knowledge anyway, and I'm certainly no expert in every single vase or every single inscription, those are what the epigraphers do, but there are books, really good books, okay. for the translation of all that into a literal chronological history done by, say, Martin uh, Martin and Grube in the Chronicles of the Maya Kings and Queens, and then what Linda Sheely and David Fordell did in terms of the, um, the book, The Forest of Kings. And I recommend any layman interested in this stuff to get into those two books first, mm. because it really is a crash course in not only the history but the cosmological setup for their history and why they wrote things the way they did and everything else so it's it's two really good books for anybody who's maybe not going to dive in but but, uh, and they are doing academic diligence Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah but but they are relying on on uh, tangible 
surviving fragments. What about oral survival? Uh, they, refer, they they do both, right? So this is again what. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they, they they look at the dialects, right? Because you have to. If you don't mm. look at the dialects, then you can't determine vowel sounds. You can't de- determine uh, a lot of things, right? <clears throat> so it's quite a quite a thing they've done. Because academicians tend to dismiss and devaluate oral, especially contemporary oral traditions. Yeah, I wouldn't say that in this case. No, no that's good. This is why but, I but, but uh, I mean, they have to have some notion of how the world goes on under in the fifth, because this isn't the first time the fifth is done, right? That's right. Obviously. Yeah. So it's been done many times, but they didn't really. So e- even though they're not speaking of 2087 per se, there must be already in the system a system of how this works, and then we can deduct which one is occurring. Yeah, the system of death and rebirth. It's, it's just that. Yeah. So so which cataclysm <laughs> is due for uh, yeah. 87? Then, if we look at their scheme. Yeah. Well, who knows, right? I don't know. I don't know. I, I really don't know. I mean, I'm conceptualizing it. That's okay. You don't know. But don't you think it's possible to find out? No, I don't think so. No. So they never wrote which age should go under by water and which age should go under by fire, etc. Yeah, but it's not so orderly as that. Okay. Okay. You know, Because in Indian it is. There they say. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I understand that. And, yeah. and in this, in terms of the archive, I don't want to speculate that it is because it isn't. It doesn't appear that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and don't forget that we're dealing with hundreds of these five age cycles over, you know, like we pointed out, right. hundreds of years, right? And so <laughs> at some point, they're only dealing with the most pertinent information, which is the time cycle that they're in. Uh, although the math goes back. Plus, libraries are lost, right? So we don't yeah, know what, exactly. how complete it was. Yeah. Exactly. The math is there, but the overlaying theology or conceptualization or philosophy or, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, isn't there that, to go all the way back mm. so that we have all this yeah, right. historical record to, uh, to draw from. That may have existed, mm. right? Mm. But it was destroyed. And yeah. And that gets into again the novel, uh, why that's uh, that's all contained in the novel. Okay, okay. You, you touched that. No, I, I, I even I even speculate in the novel as to what this coming cataclysm is about, but I don't have uh, a, you know any kind of concrete mm. archive to go on, other than the ones I just told you, the Popel Vu. Mm. But that's just, is that is that translated now? Is that available in English? Absolutely, it is. Yeah, mm. yeah. You can get a very good version by Dennis Tedlock. He actually lived here in San Cristobal de las Casas. Was approached by a Mayan shaman who volunteered to provide him with a deeper understanding by translating the original text for him mm. in, to help him in his translation into English, and that took place in the uh, in the nineties. Did he accept that offer? Of course he did. <laughs> mm. Yeah, he did. Mm. So it's from the Tsotsu, or Tsotsu, if you will, and the Quiche Maya, who are the the origin of this Popol Vuh. Mm. Yeah. Okay. We should take a break. Are we done, okay, do you think, yeah. about the general outline, or, or is there other basis you want to cover regarding the mystics? No, no, of- the rest of it I can weave into more or less a summary of what I've been writing. Yeah, yeah. So we're done with part one. That's right. Okay. So let's take a proverbial break. And when we come back, we'll explore more on this. Yes, that's good. good, good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show... You can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. Thanks.